Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the main interview room. Hope you're all enjoying NC State student athlete breakouts. The NC State student athletes are also available in the NC State locker room as well until 1045. So when the student athlete breakout sessions end, student athletes from NC State will be available in the NC State locker room. That goes until 1045. In just a moment, we're going to have head coach Kevin Keats join us 15 minutes after that. DJ Burns is going to join us as well. We'll have a 15-minute session with head coach Kevin Keats. It's about to begin. Just a reminder, please take a moment to silence your cell phone, refrain from any flash photography or recording of video, including cell phones, including mobile devices, including handheld cameras and mini cameras. We'll have a transcript of this media availability session available almost immediately after it concludes, and we'll have video as well. Good morning, Coach. How are we doing? Hey, good morning. How are you? Good. You want to give everybody uh, your thoughts for this morning, and then we'll take some questions. Yeah, good morning, guys. Um, excited to be back in front of you. I uh, think I got to take this time before I get started. Our, our women's team is playing today in Cleveland against a very good South Carolina team, and I want to wish, uh, um, wish uh, Coach Moore and the Lady Wolfpacks, really good luck, um, really good team, and I've enjoyed their season and watching them, and uh, can't you know can't wait to to watch them play today. So, on that part of it, go pack. Um, our guys are um, we're excited about the opportunity, as you guys know, and you know it, it's you know I, I think it's starting to sink in with some of our guys that there's only four teams left in the entire country, and we're one of those teams, and. Um, you know, looking forward uh, for the opportunity of playing against a really good Purdue team and well-coached and really good basketball players. And so um, looking forward to um, obviously our last opportunity to uh, practice today and then obviously the game tomorrow. Thank you, Coach. We have four microphone attendants out among the crowd of reporters this morning. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll take one up front on the left side. Yes, sir. Hey, Coach, uh, three high school coaches in this Final Four. Um, I'm curious, like, do you, how inspiring do you think that is for other high school coaches watching the journey of yourself, Danny Hurley, and Nate Oates? And in some ways, you know, is it more challenging coaching high school uh, than even coaching at this level? Well, I just think, it, I think it, it shows you that, you know, you can get a foundation from anywhere and you got to start somewhere. And um, like I, I hope this is inspiring any high school, any AAU coach that thinks that he cannot make it to this level um, to be able to coach. You know, some of the best uh, coaches in the world are high school guys, and they're doing the same thing that we're doing, but they're not making a lot of money to do it. And certainly, you know, when you're at that level, some coaches just get a stipend of maybe $2,000 or $2,500 um, to do their job. And they do it for the love of the game. And I think that's what's so special about it. And I hope that, you know, I get, I'm get my inspiration to anyone who's sitting there thinking that they can't make it because they can. And the, the other two guys, too. We got to talk to Matt Painter. I'm not sure why he didn't start at high school, but we got to have a conversation with him about that. Let's get him a microphone for the follow-up. I was just curious, did you ever come to this event to network? Because I know that's a big thing for high school coaches. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I came here when I was at Hargrave Military Academy um, plenty of times, and I was doing it in a different way. I was trying to network in case they had a kid that didn't make it who would send them to prep school for me, but also for future uh, opportunities. Coach, we'll head over to the right side, midway back. Dan? Kevin, hey, Dan, welcome to USA Today. Um, another hard, hard question. When you were there, obviously you had you know, everybody coming to recruit your players there. What did you learn about just the recruiting process and, and how to be a good recruiter from you know, the people who were coming to Hargrave to, to try to get your players? Well, I learned, I learned that you needed right of the way to, to run a good program. You know, we were a you know, military school, not the most popular place for kids to come. Uh, we were able to convince some guys to come through Hargrave, um, obviously take care of the academics and didn't have a chance to be able to recruit it at a high level. And we were averaging about 10 or 11 Division One guys per year. But we saw who's who of college basketball. And I, it, it was funny because when I first got my first you know, college job, 
kind of had a cheat sheet because I knew everybody's sales pitch and what they were talking about. When I went to Marshall, I knew every mid-major coach and what he was talking about their program and then doing the same thing when I went to Louisville as assistant coach. So I learned so much. I learned how to, you know, put together a practice plan. I, I learned how to recruit. Um, but I also was able to watch some guys who came through the, you know, through the um, – to, to recruit our guys and be able to see how they interacted and, you know, what they did. And um, I wouldn't pass that experience for anything. It was, it was you know, a really a great experience for me. It was a great foundation to help me grow to where I'm at today. Coach, we'll go to the back of the room, left side. Kevin, Rod Baxley, Fable Observer. How would you describe what Jaden Taylor's provided for you guys throughout this season and the role he's played? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, probably a little bit unsung hero. You know, he, you know, he started for us, then he's coming off the bench. Um, he's been really, really good for us defensively. You know, I think he's one of the guys that really anchors our defense and, you know, gets involved. But he's had some stretches that may have not been talked about like some of the other guys where he has, he's had five or six games where I thought he's really played well. He's really grown. I think, you know, um, when, you know, he came here, he was trying to do too much. And now he's comfortable in what he's doing and handling the basketball and getting out in transition. And uh, but I tell you what, you know, he's another guy that's been so important to our run. If you have a question for Coach Keats, please raise your hand. We'll send a microphone attendant in your direction up front on the right side. Uh, with all the camera and theatrics following this event, what are you doing to not only let your team like enjoy the fun, but also keep their head focused on the main goal and why you're here? Oh man, we got we have less cameras on us now than we have. They, I mean, they film each other every day. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, that that changes. You know, it used to be different, but when you got Snapchat and you got Instagram and you got everything, you know, these guys are so used to being in front of a camera. Um, they're they're okay with it. You know, we we're gonna enjoy it because I've asked them to. Uh, I talked about yesterday being 50. 50, business and pleasure. Today, uh, we should be 75%. So if you see somebody that's having too much fun, it's supposed to be 75% today, you know, business and 25% fun. But I, I think our guys enjoy it. They, and, and I'm happy to see some of those guys. And, you know, I, I have to go back and look at a couple of them because um, I'm not sure, sure they should be dancing in front of the camera because a couple of those guys can't dance. Just a reminder, no video recording in the main interview room, and please identify yourself by name and media outlet before your question. Up front, in the center. Jacob Saliga, Arizona Varsity. Coach, uh, statistically, the Wolfpack entering the tournament were one of the lower-ranked uh, rebounding teams in the conference. Entering the tournament, we've seen the team rebounding as a whole really take a step. Do you feel like the emphasis on that during both the ACC tournament and throughout the tournament has helped create extra opportunities on the offensive end and has helped contribute to your defense really stifling opponents during this run? Yeah, we had a couple things that we really needed to correct, and one of them was rebounding. You know, obviously, um, we try to win the turnover battle um, by forcing steals. But we were giving up a lot of offensive rebounds, so we were losing that battle because people had second chance points. Uh, going into the postseason, we wanted to clean up our transition defense, which we thought wasn't very good. Uh, rebounding was another one, and then being really stingy defensively and guarding the three-point line. I think those three focuses are uh, the reason why we're here today because we got better in those areas. In the second row toward the right, my coach Tom Bruce, Sports Illustrated Fan Nation. You get your Got a lot of transfers on your team this year. I was curious if you could take me back to the summer, like when they all sort of arrived. Like, how did uh, all that work in regards to putting, getting those guys to know each other well and all that? Was that more on the other players who were already there or coaches? Or how did all that work out for you guys? Yeah, you know, we, we have seven transfers and one freshman. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, how to get some type of chemistry in the summertime. You know, uh, fortunate for us, the year before, we took a foreign trip to Bahamas. We had 10 days of practice. We had a chance to play against some really good teams. We didn't have that this year coming into this year. And so we did a lot of team bonding things. Uh, we went um, back to my old stomping grounds, um, Wilmington, North Carolina, and spent, a, you know, three or four days down there and trying to come together and doing stuff on the beach and hanging out and practicing down there. So we try to create some, some type of chemistry. Um, because we, I, I'm one of those coaches that feels like if you have great chemistry off the court, 
it, you're going to have it on the court. So we did a lot of team um, building things. We brought some people in to talk to our team and talk about teamwork and all of that stuff. If you have a question for Coach Keats, please raise your hand. We'll send a microphone in your direction. We have one up front. Hi, Coach. Adriana Sparks with NAC Sports. Um, Dyara is observing Ramadan this month, as you probably know. Uh, he's, he's very de devoted to his faith. Uh, would you say that that's a reflection of who he is as a teammate and as a player? He, he's amazing. I mean, he has stayed very true to his faith and true to his teammates. Um, you know, I, like I, what he's doing now is incredible. Um, the numbers that he's putting up and, and obviously um, how he's playing and the personality that he's become and how he's working with his team and, you know, going through everything that he's going through and being able to perform at the highest level, um, that says a lot about his character. And, you know, it's funny, I've seen him grow from the time that he's gotten here to now, and it's, uh, it's been an amazing journey to watch him, you know, come out of his shell. We do have a few more moments for questions for Coach Keats. In a few moments, we're going to invite our students from the Full Court Press Program to uh, ask Coach Keats some questions, and also NC State student athlete DJ Burns. So media will lose their opportunity with Coach Keats in just a few moments. If you have some questions, we'll, we'll take them. Uh, Coach Mark Sigler, San Diego Union Tribune. Apologize if you've been asked this. Do you consider yourself a Cinderella? given your seed, or, or do you not considering what conference you belong to? We don't. I mean, we, we, we play in the best conference in college basketball, and we know that. And we just, um, you know, I, I would say this, it's weird to say this, is when we were 11 seed and we played Texas Tech, who was the sixth seed, I really didn't think it was fair to either team. You know, I didn't think, you know, if I'm Texas Tech, I'm like, why do I, if, well, as a sixth seed, why am I playing against NC State? And then I'm saying to myself, you know, with, with the run that we had, um, I thought we could be possibly an eight or nine seed going into the tournament. You know, you don't win five games in five days and beat the teams that you beat and then, you know, get 11 seed, which is fine. We're, we're happy to be here. Um, but I don't think that we're Cinderella. I think if you ask um, anyone that we played, they would probably say the same thing. But if that's what it, if that's what it takes, we'll be okay. I will say this to you. Um, round of 16, we were possibly ranked the 16th team. Round of uh, Elite Eight, we're the 18th. Final Four, we're the 14th. And so it's kind of worked out for us. So you know, we'll, we'll take whatever name that we get, but we, we believe. And, you know, obviously we came here to have the opportunity to um, cut the nets down, not, you know, as a Cinderella. And, you know, we'll, we'll take whatever they give us. Question up front. Hi, Coach Keys. Ava Nichols, NAZ Today. I'm just curious, have you been to Arizona before? What are your thoughts? And how special is it for the team to be traveling so far? kind of coast to coast almost. Yeah, I have been to Arizona before, and it's, I love it. I mean, it's, this is great. I mean, everybody, I would take this moment to say that um, everybody here in Arizona has been tremendous to us, and uh, we've become, you know, more of the uh, fan favorite. Um, and DJ Burns has become the, more of the fan favorite, and uh, but I, I, I love it here. I mean, I just – Number, number one, we've had great weather. I'm one of those guys, if you can give me great weather, I'm already, already going to love you a lot. Um, but it's been a great place. And um, the folks here that are running everything have taken care of us in the right way. And they've got one more job to do. They've got to help us get a win. And then I really tell you how much I love it. Yeah. Coach, up front in the center. Brett Friedlander, Saturday Road. Um, you just mentioned DJ. Uh, all the attention, all the hoopla around him, does it mind you? A little bit of the, you know, the attention that Zion Williamson got a couple of years ago. I mean, is that kind of the, the, the depth of it, or and how is he handling it? I mean, are you, I mean, are you worried that possibly he can get overwhelmed by it? No. With, now I will say this: when Zion was here, I never paid any attention to. It. I don't even know if I even went to that Final Four. Um, I can talk about DJ. You know, I, I think he's handling it great. I mean, this is who he is. I mean, he. He's eating this stuff up. He'll be up here beside me, and he'll be smiling, and he'll be laughing. And um, 
but he's a tremendous personality. And, you know, I, I said this to all of our players before we got here, that March is for the players. Now I got to say the same thing about April. It's for the players. It's, you know, as coaches, you know, we, we you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pull the strings and I'm going to sub some guys in. But you make your name in the NCAA tournament as a player and personality. And it's just so many personalities that I've seen over the years in this tournament. And DJ Burns is one of the biggest personalities that we're ever going to meet. Yeah. Is there a final question for Coach? And the back toward the right. We can take these two. How's it going, Coach? Jake Seymour, WCSN. Uh, DJ Horn obviously transferred from ASU uh, to NC State this year. Just when you were kind of looking at him in the portal, what were some of the things that kind of stood out and made him a good fit for the team this year? Well, it was two things. You know, he's a hometown guy. And so getting him back to Raleigh, I thought that was very important. Uh, but his ability to score the basketball. You know, we lost uh, to Quavion Smith and Jaquel Joyner, who were really good players who led us to the NCAA last year. And I, I had to go out. I knew I couldn't replace both of those guys, but I had to go out and at least try to replace one. And when we looked in the portal and I, I watched enough stuff and synergy on uh, DJ, I, I knew that he could be a guy that could come in. And we talked about our system. You know, I, I, here he averaged about you know, 12, 13 points a game, but I knew our system would you know, be able to add about four or five points to what his average is. But so excited to have him. Um, you know, I thank you guys for giving him to us. <laughs> you know, we needed him, and he's done a great job for us. We're going to welcome in DJ Burns at this time while the big fella ascends to the top of the dais. We'll take another question for Coach on the right side. We're DJ, use that back right. DJ, D. Oh, there he is. Hey, DJ. <laughs> you go ahead with your question while DJ settles in. What are you sitting here? Coach Scott. Coach Scott Sanduli, uh, Cronkite Sports. In your opinion, there's a lot of parallels between this team and the 1983 championship squad. What kind of presence have any of those guys had with this team? And how do you go about kind of making your own history this weekend? Yeah, I, I think the they've had a great influence on our team uh, because they are, are willing to share their knowledge and their love and talk about their team in 83. Like when you hear their stories, it's um, unbelievable. Not only the 83 team, but the 74 team too. We had a, a banquet where, you know, we had a chance to sit there and listen to those guys and guys like Tommy Burleson and uh, David Thompson and just to share their story. Um, we hear, I hear from all of those guys through text messages or a phone call. Um, is it the same? I don't know that. I wasn't there. Um, I do think our guys are creating their own um, situation. Uh, but we will be blessed if, if you get a you get a chance to be mentioned in the name in the same sentence with the 83 team. That's not a bad thing. That's actually a great thing. But I do think that we're creating our own moments. We'll take one final question from Bill up front to the right. And then we're going to begin our questions with our full court press students. That's going to be everyone in this room with a black lanyard. So hey, go ahead, Bill. Hey, Coach. Uh, uh, Bill Roden from uh, ESN. I'm just curious. I, I know you been asked this question, you'll probably be asked this question for the next 20 years, but about the portal. Uh, and you've seen the whole evolution of it. The kind of bottom line, has this made your life as a head coach, as a recruiter, has it made your life easier or has it been a, a headache? I know, I, mean, I, I know it's more complex than that, but yeah. that's what I say. I, I, I say both. Um, you know, I wish that um, we didn't have to as we're in this greatest event that we're in, uh, deal with the portal. I wish it was a little bit later. Uh, but I'm also, you know, a coach that believes that if there are opportunities for guys to leave and um, they want to, then, to let, then let them leave. Like, I don't ever want a player to be in my program that doesn't want to be there. Um, I think you get the best out of anybody who is dedicated, committed, wants to play for Kevin Keats, wants to play for NC State. Uh, and if someone's unhappy with that, then certainly you don't want that part of it. So I go back and forth with it. I, I, I like the portal a lot. I just didn't wish, I wish we didn't have to deal with it at this time. And, you know, uh, we've done pretty good in the portal, so I'm excited about it. I got this young man out of the portal. All five of our starters are from the portal. And so I got to be a big fan of it. Uh, but I do say this to you. You got to be really careful in who you bring from the portal. You got to get guys who really fit into what you believe in and trust in and have the same vision that, that you have as a coach. 
For the next 12 minutes, we're going to take questions for the students from the Full Court Press Program and those black lanyards. They could be questions for DJ Burns or for Coach Keats. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll send a microphone attendant in your direction. We have one up front and center. Um, what's going on? My name is Jalen Weathers, and I really, I guess, it's a question for you or just for both of you guys. And I'm just curious. You guys are obviously on this big stage, playing on Final Four now, and we got to focus on what's at hand. Obviously, you're gonna want to you want to win the game, but at the same time, you're at the Final Four, so that means at the same time, it's like you got to be grateful. So, like, for you guys, how have y'all been able to find a balance? You're just being able to stay focused, being able to execute what's at hand, but at the same time, just taking a moment and just realizing you're here. And coach, we're going to feed the big man first. Let's let DJ take that and then coach can answer as well. Uh, honestly, I think that goes back to having the coach that we have. You know, he told us when we first got here, he said, go enjoy it. But no, when we get on that court, I need you to focus 100%. So um, he's done a good job of reeling us back in when we need and letting us enjoy it when we're not needing to be focused right now at the moment. Coach. Yeah, I just like to, your, to answer your question, we came here to win. And, and I think a lot of times folks do get to the Final Four and they're just so excited about it, they, f they forget, you know, here's the main ingredient. The main ingredient is to come here, work hard. Your work is put, the work that you put in to win. And that's why I've had this 50-50, 75-25, 100% in the last three days, you know, business versus pleasure. And we're up to, like I said, we're up to 75% business today, 100% tomorrow. Yesterday was a, a mixture of, you know, 50-50 and fan fest and all that other stuff. But now it's time to get closer to locking into, um, obviously, what our job is. We're taking questions right now for those individuals with the Full Court Press Program. If you have a black lanyard, you can raise your hand. We'll send a microphone in your direction. On the right side. Hi, guys. My name is Melody. I just had a question. Um, it's your second year coaching this team, and you also have your son on the team. I'm just wondering if, if that has been more of a motivation um, to really show out for this team and, you know, do great by your son and your team that you have brought to the Final Four. Yeah, I have my son on the team and very grateful to have him. I have one problem with my son being on the team is his mom. Um, you know, she's the only one that you know has the ability to be able to complain to me 24-7 about her child. Um, I'm teasing. Uh, no, it's, it's been great. It's uh, rewarding. It's not an extra motivation. It's, um, you know, obviously, you know, my son, you know, he's been around basketball forever. He understands. Um, he wants to win just as much as I do. Uh, he is in the locker room. He is part of these guys and the memories that I am creating, but he's creating great memories with his team, and I think that's so special too. Yep. Was there a follow-up from the left side of the room that we can accommodate at this time? Or? <laughs> we'll take questions from the individuals from the Full Court Press Program. If you have a black lanyard, raise your hand. We have another question up front in the center. So I know the job isn't complete yet, but so far in the tournament, inside the game or outside the game, what's been your favorite moment so far with being in this tournament? That question's for DJ. Uh, I would say as far as the tournament, um, either after the Marquette game, you know, celebrating with the fans, or after the Duke game, you know, um, just the love, seeing how these people are out there crying, man, you know, because we're winning games and doing stuff that hasn't been done. And, 30 or more years, you know, um, I think it's just awesome to be able to bring the culture back to, you know, rally. Coach, do you have a favorite tournament moment so far? Uh, all of them my favorite. You know, we, we've had it, we've had nine elimination games, and they are all my favorite, you know. You know, touch on to what DJ said. When we got back uh, to campus after, you know, making the Final Four, after beating Duke in Elite Eight, you know, it, it's, it was simply amazing. Uh, our campus was on complete fire. Everybody was just pumped up because of the fact that, um, you know, so many of our students, so many of their parents had not had a chance to experience what folks experienced in 83. And so just to, to see the smiles and the students and um, just administrators, and I, I can't tell you how many text messages and emails I've gotten, um, but also to see the reward of the team, this current team, and the I know the hard work that they've been through and the adversity that they've been through, to be able to see those guys get to this bigger stage, um, I think that was incredible for me. Continuing with full court press questions, if there are any. If you have a question, raise your hand. Um, back, back there. 
Got one in the back? Oh, yeah, all right. Yeah. Good eyes, Cody. Yeah, she's been patient, so. <laughs> Hi, so my question is if you guys have any superstitions. My mom told me, uh, NC State alum in my community, he's been wearing the same outfit since you guys got in the tournament, and he has not, I mean, he's, he's obviously changed it, but for every game, he's worn the same outfit. Do you guys have any superstitions like that? DJ? Uh, not myself. I'll let him say that one. You don't, you don't have any? Only thing I do is I listen to the same music before, you know, the same music from high school. But other than that, not really. Yeah, I, I got too many. I mean, I, I'll take his. I'm, I'm wearing the same shoes that, you know, I've wore for the eight games. And um, I listen to the same music um, that, you know, I completely, you know, every, every, every trip I go, I listen to Marvin Sapp. And uh, the best of me, and um, you know those things. I listen to some gospel music, and uh, but I I do the same thing. I go to the and each place that we've been, I eat the same lunch. I got to figure out where I'm eating today because I'm gonna eat there tomorrow. And I kind of like to do it peaceful. I do it by myself. And so if you guys, if you're all seeing me eat lunch, just give me 45 minutes and let me enjoy that lunch because it's. Uh, I'm preparing us for a win by doing that, just so you know. But coaches, we're creatures of habit. We got so many of them. If, if you ask me in about 30 minutes, I'll probably come up with about 10 more that I do that I don't even realize that I do. But I do a lot. Any further questions from the Full Court Press program? We have one on the right side in the back, and then we'll come back up front. Hi, my name is Jimmy uh, from Arizona State. Uh, when the tournament starts, you have millions of eyes on 60-plus teams. Now you flash forward to today, there's just you and three other teams, but the same amount of eyes. What do you guys do to kind of block out the noise through these past few weeks? We'll have DJ take that first, then coach. Uh, just don't read it, honestly. Um, it's going to be everywhere, and you can't really avoid it, but you can control how much you know, feed into it. Yeah, I think it's. I think you just stay locked in. I mean, you know, I just I saw something the other day that our Duke um, game was one of the um, highest viewed games in a long time, and you know, I think you know, I, I think it's a little overrated because I think when you get on that court and there's five guys on the court and there's another five guys, I think you're locked into those guys and don't really worry about what the outside world is thinking and. Our guys have um, handled every moment as great as it can. I, I don't know that there's another team in the country that has played with what everyone would consider pressure. Um, you know, I, I've said this, if we lose any game in the ACC, we don't make the NCAA tournament. And if we lose any game in the NCAA, we don't advance to the Final Four. And so we're battle-tested in that way. Um, and I, I think our guys enjoy that. Back up front. So I know you was talking about Marvin Sapp, man. So for you, though, or really for both of y'all, what's your go-to song? How not, not that y'all was saying y'all listen to the same music? DJ first. OK. Um, unfortunately, mine is not a gospel song. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when I first walk onto the court, the first song I always play is Just Bars by G Herbo. That's my favorite um, rap artist. Coach? My, my go-to songs are Never Would Have Made It by Marvin Sapp and The Best of Me. I mean, Google it. You're going to like it. I'm telling you. I just, and it's weird because I'm bobbing my head and, and all my players think I'm listening to some rap song. I mean, I'm getting into Marvin Sapp and uh, those have been, I have listened to those songs for years and years and um, it really means something to me that, you know, it's kind of, I take every word and um, obviously I say this before, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the good Lord. So I listen to a lot of gospel. Anybody want to drop any bars before we go? Now we're all set there. D now, DJ's a rapper now. If you guys want to hear him rap, he says he has a rap song. So, Yeah, not right now. Not right now. <laughs> we'll say that for later. <laughs> We'd like to thank DJ. Oh, we have another question. Let's take that one. Right side, midway back. How you doing? Uh, my name is Josh. I'm a student at ASU. I feel like when you face a lot of new things, like your character could be tested. DJ, for you, how has your character as a man grown just since this tournament? Uh, man, you know, um, honestly, for me, I used to do a lot of responding to negative comments on social media. I just kind of, you know, zeroed that out. You know, we don't got time for that anymore. We'll take a final question toward the front of the room on the right side. Okay, I just want to say, I said it was your second year of coach. 
coaching this team. I meant to say seventh. So I do, I like looked at my notebook and I was like, I'm so sorry. I um, just want to formally apologize for that. But you guys, this team has been deemed as like America's team. Um, I just wanted to ask like how you guys felt about that and with this newfound um, motivation and how you guys plan on taking that further in the future for the next season. You want to take it or you want to take it? Uh, I think it's interesting, you know, um, it's also pretty cool to be recognized for your work. You know, it had to come a little bit later, but so be it. You know, we're here now, and that's really all that matters. We enjoy it. Yeah, I think it was going to be us or Oakland. I think us or Oakland was going to be the America's team, and um, fortunate for us, it's us. We'd like to thank DJ and Coach Keys for joining us in the main interview room today. Hope you guys enjoy that your open practice and the rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, guys. The Purdue locker room will open at 11 a.m. for interviews with student athletes. We'll also have breakout sessions to my right and your left with the Purdue student athletes. But before that, in just a few moments, we'll be joined by the AP Player of the Year, Zach Eady and Barry Bedlin from the Associated Press for the uh, presentation of the Associated Press Player of the Year Award. The Coach of the Year will be awarded at 3.05 p.m. in this room. That's in addition to my schedule. It might be in addition to your schedule as well.
We're joined now by Barry Bedlin from the Associated Press and the AP Player of the Year for the second straight year, Zach Eady. We're also joined by the entire Purdue basketball team and the media corps. Barry's going to introduce the two-time Player of the Year right now. Take it away, Barry. Can we keep the heckling down during this? Uh, okay, guys, thank you. Uh, I'm Barry Bedlin. I'm the Sports Products Director for the Associated Press. It's my pleasure today to present the AP College Basketball Player of the Year Award. Since 1961, the recipient of this award has been selected by the same panel of journalists who select the weekly AP Top 25. Voting for the award is conducted at the end of the regular season before the start of the NCAA tournament. If you were paying attention to this season, the AP Player of the Year is no surprise. In fact, this is kind of like Groundhog Day for him uh, because he received the trophy on this uh, stage last year. In fact, he is the first player to win this award a second time in just over 40 years. The last to do it was Virginia's Ralph Sampson, the award's only three-time winner from 1981 to 1983. This year's recipient joins an elite club of only six repeat winners, others in, that, in, the, in the award's 63-year history. Others include UCLA's Lou Elcinder and Bill Walton, NC State's David Thompson, and Ohio State's Jerry Lucas, the award's first winner and the only other Big Ten player to repeat. This star from Toronto, Canada also was named the unanimous AP All-American and the Big Ten Player of the Year, both also for a second year. He led the nation in scoring, averaging 25 points per game, and was second in rebounds with 12.2 per game, and he also finished the season with 28 double-doubles. He is the first player since Oscar Robinson, Robertson in 1960 to lead the nation in scoring and lead his team to the Final Four. In fact, he recorded a career-high 40 points at the most opportune time against Tennessee in the Elite Eight, leading the Boilermakers to their first Final Four in 44 years. Known as Big Maple, he is still listed as being 7'4", but I swear he's only gotten taller since last season. This year's AP Men's Bas College Basketball Player of the Year is Purdue's Zach Eady. So we'll do the, we'll do the old presentation here, right? I mean, you, you don't have to stand on the most things. <laughs> All right, we'll let you go ahead and make some comments. Yeah. I didn't really have anything planned. Um, you know, it's an honor to uh, receive this and join that elite club of people. Um, it's just been a heck of a season for not just me, but my team. Um, I'm, I'm so proud of everything that we've accomplished to this point. Obviously, we still have more, more games left to play, but um, with the amount of, of stuff that we've gone through, the amount of stuff we've heard, um, to be able to bounce back and, and accomplish things that we've had up to this point, uh, it's, it's been uh, part of the, the favorite, my favorite year I've ever lived in. Um, just the experiences and going through it with the guys, like uh, I, w I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade the group of people I went through with it for anything. We're going to take questions now for Zach and for Barry. Just a housekeeping note, since. Zach is the player of the year. He's going to do his session here. He's also going to have a breakout session with the other Purdue student athletes. But Zach will not be available in the locker room, just here and in the breakout. So if you have questions for Zach, now's a good time to get those in. We also have at least one microphone handler, and we're going to uh, bring the microphone to you. Uh, we're breaking out some more right now. We have a question up front in the center. We're going to bring a microphone down that way. Uh, but again, raise your hand if you have a question. And we're going to go with the front left microphone, and here's our question. Hey, Zach, Raphael from the three-point conversion. First of all, congrats. Last year you won it, of course, but you weren't playing at this time. So now that you are playing, are you able to enjoy it like you went to, or is it one of those things like, we're going to wait, I'm going to handle this business right now, and then after the tournament, I will definitely, you know, think about it and enjoy it and, you know, so on. Yeah, I always kind of think that these awards are something that uh, I'll look back on in the future um, and really appreciate and, and like kind of all sink in in the future. Right now, it kind of hasn't. Um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm living kind of like in the moment like we have like this is a big award this is a big deal for me um, but I have I have bigger things on the horizon here uh, that demand my attention like you, you said like last year I wasn't playing at this time this year I, I definitely like my position uh, this year more so um, just being appreciative of kind of everything that's happened for me and, and trying to stay in the moment and then like I said in the future I'll Oh, I think that's when it'll sink in, and that's when I'll, I'll be able to appreciate all this. Another housekeeping item. This is one of the few news conferences you can roll video on, so if you'd like to with your cell phone or with any other device, feel free. If you have a question for Zach or for Barry, please raise your hand. We'll get a microphone stored in your direction. We have one in the center. Second row. Hey, Zach. Kurt Kretschmar, Fox Sports Radio. When you cut your part in the Nets down, you took part of it and handed it to Coach Katie. So was that thought of ahead of time, or was it a spontaneous moment, and what did that mean to you? Um, well, it meant to me, like, it's just, just paying, uh, paying it back. Like, he, the ones that came before, you always have to remember, you can't, like, like no one on this team is overlooking. Like, I think that's the one, the great thing about Purdue, like, like when you're when you commit to Purdue and when you play for Purdue, like you're in the Purdue family for life. So like you see people on the sideline, like Robbie's crying, like Coach Katie's having a great time, like his wife's crying. Like I look up in the family section, there's like there's people that I've known forever, like that are crying. Um, so I think that's the one great thing about Purdue. Like we really pay respect to the people that came before us and we acknowledge them and we um, like we don't overlook that. So I think just being able to give him kind of like a, a piece of that net and being able to have him be a part of that and make sure he knows that he, he like we, we know he's a part of this um, was a great feeling. So one quick follow up. That being said, Drew Brees, has he reached out to you? Have you been able to meet him or talk with him? Um, no, I've never really talked to him personally. Um, obviously, I know about him. He's one of the greatest Purdue athletes ever. Um, but no, I haven't really talked to him too much. If you have a question for Zach or for Barry, please raise your hand. We're going to send a microphone in your direction. Up front on the right side. Hey, Zach. Uh, just right down here. Arash Madani, Sportsnet Canada. Um, so often it's just seemed over the last two years, everyone's talked about everything you can't do rather than what you are doing. As you sit here at a Final Four with another trophy like this in front of you, what do you think you're starting to show and have proven to the basketball world? Um, well, I don't think I have to, to prove anything. I think uh, what I've done um, like speaks for itself. But I think the people that can't appreciate um, some of the stuff, like I, I don't really pay them any mind anymore. Like you know, Obviously, for the first few years, it would, would kind of like get me upset, get me off balance, whatever. But uh, I've been dealing with it for so long, it's not, it's not anything crazy. It just makes me appreciate um, the people that do care about me more, like my teammates, my family. Um, the Purdue like fans like like I'm one of those that are signing stuff after every game is because like they I know they appreciate me like uh, and I, I value that like I know it sounds kind of corny but like I I value the people that value me um, and I'm gonna focus on them. Have you heard from any of the national team guys over the last week? I mean, you've gotten to a Final Four, a lot of them haven't. Have you heard from any of the guys? Yeah, a few of them like been like slide off my stories, or whatever, congratulating me um, for sure. Up front on the left side, raise your hand, please. Thank you. Zach, um, would you say you have a different way of motivating yourself than other people? And, and kind of how did you how did you find that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I know I play better when I like get angry. So obviously I'm trying to get angry before a game. Um, everyone kind of has their own thing, whether it's listening to music or, or stretching or doing something. It's just, just my little thing. Zach, we have a question from a curious young man kind of in the back of the room on the left. Uh, grab the microphone, please. There you go. Mason Gillis here with the Purdue basketball team. And a couple of us were wondering when you knew that nobody could guard you. Next question. <laughs> we'll take one more. If there's no follow-up to that, we'll take one more on the left side of the aisle for Zach. Zach, the level of shape that you've gotten yourself in is really impressive this year. Obviously, only sitting 33 seconds in the Elite Eight game. Uh, what sort of work like went into that between you know the difference between maybe the summer going into your junior year to the summer going into your senior year it just seems like your conditioning is truly at a tip-top level uh for the most important games of the season yeah i think uh, a big thing that kind of comes with uh having a big role on teams is obviously you gotta play a lot of minutes i'm never gonna complain about um 
like playing minutes. I'm, I'm going to try to get myself into my best shape possible so I can play as many mi minutes as paint allows me. Um, I, I want to be on that floor at all times, so I'm never going to like ask for a sub, and I think that's kind of the mentality of our whole team. We'd like to thank and congratulate Zach Eady, now the two-time Associated Press Player of the Year. Zach's going to join some of his teammates to our right and your left in the breakout areas over there for another 15-minute question and answer session. The Purdue players who are not available here in the main interview room in the breakout areas will be headed back to the locker room to take your questions for the next 45 minutes. Thank you, Zach, and thank you, Barry. Thank you. Thank you, Reed. Uh, Purdue open locker room from 11 to 11.45. That starts now as soon as the Purdue student-athletes get down to the locker room. Five Purdue student-athletes, including Zach Eady, will be available in the breakout areas to my right and your left. Matt Painter, the Purdue head coach, will join us here at 11.15, 15 minutes from now, uh, and will be joined by Fletcher Lawyer, 15 minutes after that for our full court press question and answer period. Thanks, everybody.
covers for the entrance. Right? Yeah. 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 And then you know where the entrance is, right? Yeah. 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 We know where to go. Okay, security is going to be secure. We hope everyone's enjoying the Purdue student athlete breakouts and the open locker room period. In just a moment, we'll have the head coach, Matt Painter, join us here in the main interview room. Coach Painter will be available here in the main interview room from 1115 until 1145. 15 minutes into that session, we'll be joined by Purdue student athlete Fletcher Lawyer, and we'll take questions from the full court press group only. So if you have a question for Coach Painter, the next 15 minutes is when you're going to be able to get that in. While joining us here in the main interview room, please silence your cell phone. Please refrain from using flash photography. Please refrain from recording video or going live on your mobile device. No handheld cameras, mini cameras, cell phone video, or camera phone video. You can take still shots, but without a flash. All news conference transcripts are published almost immediately after each news conference, and we have video available for your download, as well as what's going out over satellite. We're joined now in the main interview room by Purdue head coach Matt Painter. We'll ask coach to give us some thoughts on the day so far, and then we'll start to take some questions as uh, people grab some seats. Yeah, we're obviously, um, you know, just working towards, you know, getting ready for our game tomorrow. And uh, it was a joy to practice yesterday here. Um, always attended events, always around, always went to games at the Final Four to, to be able to be actually one of the teams that's out there practicing and doing things. So today's going to be a cool day um, with all the fans here and uh, to be able to go out there and, 
you know, really just have fun. You're going through your same routine that you would if there's no fans out there. But um, and I always thought it was cool because there's, you know, some fans that can't afford to go to the game or they can't get a ticket to the game, and this is their game. So to be able to go out there, and I know there will be a lot of Purdue people um, in the stands that are going to the game, but, but still they, they, they get the opportunity of being here, you know, a day early. So, we're, you know, we're excited about it. If you have a question for Coach Painter, please raise your hand. We have four microphone stewards. They'll bring the microphone towards you. I have a question. Coach Zach Eady was just here to get his second straight AP Player of the Year award, and we don't see a lot of times happen what just happened, which was you were here for that, and your entire team was also here to support Zach. We even took a question from one of your student athletes. Yeah. What, it seems like, first of all, it seems like you guys are loose enough to be doing that, to come here and, and, and right. see that sort of thing. And then uh, why, why do you think that was important? Yeah. Well, I think um, obviously he's our, you know, he's our pillar and the guy we work around and, and what we do, but it's not something from an uh, attention seeking that, that I think he likes. You know, he's, he's gotten more comfortable answering questions and getting that kind of attention. But at the end of the day, he just wants it to be a team game and he wants the attention to go to everybody. Um, so he does a great job of facilitating that and being humble, and that's refreshing. You know, who doesn't want to play with a great player, but also a great player that's unselfish and humble like he is? And um, you know, he, he's learned to take some things in stride and understand. You know, it's his value, but it's also the, the value of our team. On the right side, Lane. Hey, Coach. Lane Higgins from the Wall Street Journal. Um, after NC State's game against Duke, DJ Burns said he wasn't really that worried about being physical under the post um, with Kyle Filipowski because he knew Kyle would be worried about taking fouls. And, you know, when you have two big men going against each other, like I imagine it would be with DJ and Zach, you know, how do you kind of navigate that fine line between being aggressive and guarding someone yeah. like that and not getting into foul trouble? Yeah, that, that's a really good question because that's a big piece of the game for size because they deal with fouls a little bit differently, especially somebody like DJ Burns who seeks out that contact, and rightfully so. You know, he does a great job of, you know, getting that feel for that contact, and then he knows which – which way to go or which way to maneuver. Um, both of those guys are, are great because they can score over either shoulder. They can hurt you in a lot of different ways, but they're both really unselfish. So if you want to take away their scoring ability, they're great passers and they can get the ball out of their hands. But um, I think that's a little different matchup um, with, with Kyle Filipowski, who's a fabulous player. I, I look at him as really like a four-man you know, you could even kind of say he's kind of that hybrid forward, that 3-4 type guy. But I think you see guys like him play the five a lot because coaches are just trying to get their best players on the floor. So if they got more big guys, then he can move over the four. If they think their guards are better, they stretch it out and they put him at the five and do different things. But um, with Zach, obviously, he is a five. You know, he's, he's closer to a six than he is a four. And um, so I think that matchup's going to be, you know, a, a great matchup. Um, you know, more than anything, it's, it, it's trying to be physical without fouling. It's something we talk about a lot. Sometimes we're good at it, sometimes we're not. I think everybody kind of struggles with that. But at the end of the day, it's making people earn their points and stay in the game. And so that's something that he wants to do, DJ Burns wants to do, and that's something that Zach wants to do, but also that other team's trying to attack you. So it's, you know, you, you kind of got to manage that as a coach, especially if you get that one foul, and obviously if you get that, that second foul in the first half. Coach, our next question, all the way down the left field line, back to the warning track with Andy Katz. <laughs> um, Matt, the names that were rattled off for yeah. winning this award, um, separate the NBA part here, just college basketball, when you hear Ralph Sampson, Jerry Lucas, Kareem, uh, Bill Walton, Pete Maravich, I'm including the, the, the Robertson here. Uh, and it's an unbelievable list. It's right. a Hall of Fame list. Where do you put Zach Eady in the college basketball historical perspective right. after what he has just accomplished the last two years? Well, I think there's that consistency of, you know, being able to be a national player of the year for two years and back-to-back -back years is um, – very impressive. With that being said, like if you go back to Jerry Lucas's Ohio State games, obviously Lou Alcindor, 
um, at, at UCLA and, you know, Ralph Sampson at Virginia, you're, you're talking about a lot of success. So those guys just didn't have gaudy numbers. Their teams won a lot of games. And I think when you look at Zach, you know, he's in that same boat when it comes to individual success and team success. But um, it's a little surreal, too. You know, so like when he when we've talked about it, Andy, like when he'll pass certain guys like the scoring in the Big Ten or the rebounding in the Big Ten, like he's going by Cassie Russell or he's going by Walt Bellamy. And, you know, you know, he doesn't know who the hell Cassie Russell and Walt Bellamy are. And these guys are just legends and great players. But, you know, it's 40 years ago, 50 years ago. There's so much time has went by. So, like, you know, Jerry Lucas could arguably be the best Big Ten player ever from a career standpoint. If you go look at how many rebounds he averaged, how many points he averaged, and they were in Final Fours. I think they won a national championship, if I'm not mistaken. It was 10 years before I was born. Um, but, like, he had unbelievable numbers across the board. So when you see some of those comparisons, go look at David Robinson's numbers. Go look at Shaquille O'Neal's numbers. He's right there with both of those guys. He didn't have as many blocks as those guys did, but the rebounds and points are eerie in terms of how similar they are. If I can, can I just follow up one quick thing? You may. Please the do. The difference also with him is he was not hyped coming out of high school and didn't have all those accolades. I know obviously freshmen couldn't play many decades ago, but still, what does that say about Zach that he had to go on this learning curve yeah. to get to this elite status? Yeah, and, and that group of guys, he's the outlier. There's no, there's no question about that because – from Lou Alcindor to Jerry Lucas, you know, Elvin Hayes has been in a lot of these discussions. Um, Ralph Sampson, like all of those guys coming out of high school, were the best player in the country. And then they ended up being the best player in college, and they ended up having great NBA careers. So um, it says a lot about him. It says a lot about his development. Obviously, he has elite size. Um, he's really improved his lateral movement, his mobility overall. Um, rebounds out of his area, can change the ends, can play ball screen defense, which is so important. He's a great passer now. He had in a couple of those areas that I've said positive things about, he just wasn't there four years ago. You know, and so now that improvement and that development, you really got to give credit to him, give credit to his teammates. Uh, Brandon Brantley, one of our assistants, um, has, has put in a lot of time with him, watching video, working on things, just being fundamentally sound. And, um, you know, kudos to him. And he's, he doesn't have a wall. Where, you know, you get, you're the best player in the country when you're 14 and you recruit them when they're 18 or 19. Like, you feel pretty good about yourself, right? Like, he just doesn't have that element to him. He just takes things in and we communicate and kind of collaborate and, and then we just kind of go from there and it's, it's, it's pretty refreshing. All the way up front on the left side. Hey, Matt. Uh, yeah. Brennan Quinn from The Athletic. Uh, I I think the last game in Detroit was your worst shooting night of the season, I believe. Um, leaving there, what was the feeling of, uh, man, rebound half the misses, like how good is that and what a, right. what a weapon to have versus uh, I would prefer not to have the worst shooting night in the regional right. finals? Well, you know, it's what I said after the Gonzaga game is after we made a lot of shots, you know, who are we if we miss those shots? Can we still grind that game out and beat Gonzaga? You know, it's very hypothetical. But then the next night that happened. And so our, our dominance on the glass, Zach's dominance inside, they want to limit our threes. And, I, and they did. You know, we were three for 15. And uh, even though Lance made a big one um, there at the end of the game. And so I think that's the balance that we search. We search Zach getting the basketball, Braden Smith playing through ball screen action. But having that balance of, you know, getting to 9, 10, 11, 12 threes, to go along with Zach posting up and scoring the basketball. And if you don't get it, like, how are you going to offset that? And I think we offset that through getting some key stops late in the game and the rebounding that you mentioned. Sure. When you, and when you look at, you know, past Final Fours and the domes and the shooting numbers right. and things like that, like, are you even planning on potentially crashing you know, harder or whatever? Like, how do you see yeah. that as a weapon possibly for two more games? Right. Well, I, I think um, – you know, we're a great offensive rebounding team. So our, our problem is if we turn the ball over. I don't think our problem is if we miss shots as much, even though we're obviously not trying to miss shots, right? But that's where we've gotten into our issues. You know, I think we're 27-0 and 0 with 13 turnovers or less. 
and I think we're six and four with 14 to 17 turnovers. 17 is the most we've gotten this year. So when we get into there, we're still, you know, we can still win those games. But when we've had 13 turnovers or less, even when we struggle shooting the basketball, we've been successful. They're a little bit tighter, more of a grinder type games, but we've been successful there. Center of the room, Jeff. Uh, Jeff Portello, ESPN. Um, Lance, <coughs> sorry, Lance has been uh, sort of viewed as, as the missing piece or at least the biggest difference personnel-wise from last year. What did you like from him when he was in the portal or what, do you, what you saw in film from last season? Yeah. And what has he kind of brought to the table this season? Yeah, well, we felt that, you know, we needed a combination of some athleticism, some quickness, a guy that can make a shot, and somebody that can guard. And, and he's been able to give us, you know, all those elements. Um, the thing that you don't know is just how they are. They're kind of their makeup, even though you try to figure it out. He's got a great personality about him. He's got a good way about him. You know, he competes, but he's got a smile on his face. He's a joy to be around. And um, he had a good uh, college coach in Brian Mullins at Southern Illinois and a really good high school coach at Mike Ellis. And I'd coached one of Mike Ellis's other guys who really knew how to defend and really knew what was going on defensively when he, when he came here. So you knew you had that. And that's kind of the way of the world right now. It's kind of the landscape. You know, we got the fruits of their labor. You know, we, we were very fortunate to be able to get somebody that was a quality player that could step right in. And now we were just kind of piecing the puzzle where other programs, I think that's a much harder thing. So like that's like a tip of the cap to NC State because all of their guys, most of them, have, have come from other places. And Coach Keats has done a great job of piecing that puzzle together. It took them a little bit longer, but that's what I've told our team, like, that's that 9-0 and team. They're, they're not a they, – they were 17 and 14 at one time. That team's gone. That, that's, that's not their team. Their team is 9-0. and But that takes a little bit of time when you're piecing everything together and you've got five, six guys that, you know, have been there a year or been there a week or been there two years versus Zach Eady's been there four years. Braden and Fletch are morphing into their sophomore year. Mason Gillis is in his fifth year. Trey Kaufman's in his third year. You know, you can go right down the thing – you know, for us, and we have an international trip. So um, I think that was good for Lance, um, being able to go on that trip and, and play with our guys and get a feel for things. The row behind on the left. Hey, Coach, uh, Mark Sigler, San Diego Union Tribune. You've seen, we've seen this resurgence in the big man in college basketball at a time when the NBA kind of has gone the other direction. How do you see those two uh, styles of play evolving in the future now that we've had this, this season? with big men in college. Do you, yeah. do you think it continues in college or, 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 or does it more from the NBA? Um, it's a good question. I think it can go either way. I think it would definitely be more um, in the NBA if, if the best player is Shaquille O'Neal because you've got to have a couple guys on every roster to guard him. You know, if you have more players like him, that's the best player in the whole league, which he was for, you know, eight to ten years. He was dominant. And his career was longer than that, but I would be safe to be able to say that. When the, the best guy, or the, you have a couple guys like it, so just think David Robinson, Akeem Olajuwon, you know, Shaquille O'Neal, like on down the line, right? You know, they, they, there's a lot of Patrick Ewing. There was a lot of great centers through that era. If that happened again, even though the game has evolved, like it would shift because they're the best players, right? You know, they're the best, but it doesn't mean there's not good guards and forwards in the NBA because there's a bunch of them. But I, I think that would really change some things as, as you know, coming up. You know, Yao Ming, you know, if like can he go and, and, and do some things and be able to play like that? Or if he was coming at that time, like I don't understand that piece of it because the only thing I've ever tried to do on our level, and which is much different than the professional level, is just circle things around our best players, right? And so, like, that's what we do. Who brings value to Zach and how does Zach bring value to you? And then the, we try to talk about that. Like, so if you can make a shot and not turn the ball over and you can, you know, feed the post, you're gold for us because that makes you better and that makes him better. So it's, it's an interesting question. I don't know if you can just give a straight answer to that. But I, I know that would upset the apple cart if somebody is that dominant like a Timmy Duncan or a Shaquille O'Neal. On the left side of the aisle, Billy. Uh, Billy Witts with the New York Times. Uh, Matt, the, the college athlete experience is probably a little bit different now than when you, you played with 
questions about employment and revenue sharing and, and NIL. I'm just wondering if the term student athlete feels outdated to you. That's a fabulous question, first of all. Um, I wouldn't say it's outdated. I just think they have to have a clear definition of what name, image, and likeness is because on some fronts that's occurring and other fronts it's an auction in the spring. Make sense? It just, it, we, we have to get some parameters around what we're actually doing and what's actually going on and, and not try to just do something so we can stay out of the courts. And, and, and that's all things are happening because for a long time, what's the product? The product is the player. And they're, they're, they were viewed as amateurs, but they weren't amateurs. Well, there's a lot of money being generated through what they're doing, and they were the product. So name, image, and likeness needed to happen. We just got to get some guardrails around it to be able to, to get there. And now when you look at the student athlete, the thing that I always tell those guys is you're going to be a former player for 50 years. Don't be a fool. Understand that your education from Purdue will take you a long way understand that but also the contacts that you will make and how you treat people will take you a long way you know we all know guys that are very very talented in all of our professions that don't know how to treat people because they're so damn talented they think they can get away with it and that normally ends up being sour milk nobody wants to work with that person or be around that person even though they're talented don't be that way you know get the big picture of what's going on get the big picture of life treat people the right way but learn to kill it in two different avenues. Kill it through basketball and kill it through education, and then things will work out for you. Our next question is going to come from Bill. We're also joined right now by Purdue student-athlete Fletcher Lawyer. Questions for Fletcher and Coach Painter at this time. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, 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 I'm at, uh, Bill Rowe from uh, Aske. First of all, congratulations. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, um, just curious. I've got two questions, really. The first has to do with kind of making Billy's uh, cathedral is about the portal. I mean, there's nothing new about transfers. I mean, that's sort of been around forever. Um, but I was wondering, how has the transfer portal, the new evolution of the transfer portal, um, what do you think about it? Has it made your job easier? Is it making the profession easier, better? So that's for my first question. You know, for me, I was at the forefront of it because I was on the sub. I was the only coach on the subcommittee for the one-time transfer, and so they were really trying to figure out what the pillars were going to be so guys could transfer and be eligible right away. And, you know, they didn't have the data when they did that bill. And the thing for me was it wasn't somebody that was going to go be an NBA player or somebody who's going to go be a professional basketball player. What everybody has to understand about rules through Division Three, Division Two, NAIA, Division One, low major, mid major, high major, that 99% of them are not professional basketball players. So we, you get these opportunities. I'm not sitting here as the coach without the opportunity to have a scholarship at Purdue. And so these opportunities save lives. You know. But if you're not loyal to people, there's nothing wrong with transferring. There's people in the stands that have transferred. You've moved. It's a positive thing. But if you're changing to change and you're doing what you want to do instead of what's best for you, and now at the end of the day, if it affects your education and it affects your contacts, every person in here got something through their education to help them, but every person in here has gotten something through the contacts that they gained that have helped them move a little bit. We all have done that. You know, if I need to get another job or I need to do something, hey, man, when you make a call, Bill, you make a call for me. Like, put a call in for me. They help me out here. So we all do that. So what I, I wasn't fighting for the Zach Eadies of the world. You know, I was fighting for the people on my team and the, the low majors and the mid-majors in Division two that aren't pros. Like, now they want to do something. It's like your parents, right, that stop you from, from you doing what you want to do so you can do what's best for you so you can have a great life. It's, it is not about going pro or anything of that nature in my mind because 99% of them aren't pros. But with that being said, I don't want to take somebody's dream away from them, right? You want them to have that dream and to be able to accomplish some of those things but education is going to take you a lot longer in life and help you so you can have a quality of life. So getting a scholarship and then being able to take that and get an education is not always about basketball. It's about having a great life and having your own family and then helping other people. And if you just change three or four times and then you don't get your degree and you don't become a pro and you don't have any contacts and now you didn't take that opportunity and get any better, then what are we doing for young people? That doesn't make any sense to me. 
I don't like anybody that devalues education, and a part of this devalues education. You have to help people understand. We've all seen that story. First person in their family get an education. First person to do that. Then they start that good cycle. We all hear the news about a bad cycle. You know, but now, oh, he was a great player. What happened to him? Ah, he hit some hard times. Well, I don't want players to hit hard times. You know, I want to help them. And so we've tried to stay the same where we are with it, but I think we're kind of an outlier. But I also think where we are in our state, because we have good players there, we have good high school coaches there, Purdue's got great education. So people really got to take a step back and say, you know, if you want to move, you know, everything on movement, not everything on movement, but most everything on movement is not about winning. And it's not about maybe going to the NCAA tournament. It's about their role. They want to shoot more. They want to play more. They want to like, and so now if you have that opportunity to move and then you just want to move again, then you want to move again. The only thing you got good at was moving, you know, get good at basketball and get good at education and get good at doing what's best for you in your future. Bill has a follow-up, and then after Bill's follow-up, we're going to take questions from the individuals in the full court press program at the Black Lanyards. Bill. It's good. I'll try to make this quick. I kind of go back and forth about this. There have been a lot of people in your profession, coaches and players, whose careers were totally ended because they took extra benefits and stuff that today would just be minuscule. Correct. And I'm just wondering, what do you think about the idea? I know they talk about Reggie Bush. Let's give him the trophy. What do you think about that? About uh, I don't know what the, where the word would be amnesty or right. sponging, You know about acknowledging that I, I don't know. We need to, but what do you think about going back and saying you know maybe we should clear the record or, or whatever that kind of thing? Yeah, I, I I agree with that. Yeah, I think there needs to be a lot of deregulation on a lot of things that has happened in the past, and they need to take a you know a hard dive into looking because the amateurism was really never there. But yet we called it an amateurism. He said, hey, if you don't like that, then take the chance of, of being a pro. But yet I'm making a lot of money off of it, and they're the product, right? And so, like, it, it was a, a total contradiction. I think everybody in this room agrees with that. So hopefully, hopefully we can grow. Where I don't like it, with, like through the NCAA, and I've, I've served on a lot of committees, is there needs to be a collaboration. Like, I think his opinion matters, but I don't know if his opinion matters over mine. You know, because I've sat in his chair, and he hasn't sat in mine. You know, and, but your, your opinion matters too. When you collaborate, you hear everybody, and now to come together and just do a better job of, you know, because the adults were making that decision at the time, that person that you mentioned, he wasn't an adult, right? He was a supposed student athlete. He was just kind of doing, you know, what's he supposed to do, right? And, yeah, I, I wish they could go back and, and be able to do that. I think that would probably be the right thing. We'll take questions now from individuals in the full court press program. And we're looking for a question for Fletcher, if you have one. On the right side up front. Yes, Jalen Weathers from Arizona State. So really, I guess this is a question for you, Fletcher. And I have a, I'm curious, um, I'm a student as well, and I know I've obviously, I, well not obviously, I play sports. So for you on this big sp stage, how have you been able to focus on being present in this moment of executing these next two wins, but at the same time still focusing on your education? Like, school doesn't stop. So how have you been able to find that balance, or has it been difficult? Yeah, it, it's definitely been different. It's something you got to adjust to, uh, something you got to adjust to throughout the winter, uh, traveling to Big Ten away games, and now kind of being gone these last three weeks, it's been tough. But ultimately, we got the right people in place. They've done a good job. Uh, whether it's getting us tutors or people making sure we're getting our work done, uh, making sure we're emailing our professors, all that. But uh, ultimately, it's been a lot. It's been a lot to do. It's been, um, it's been busy work here. So making sure having the right people in place, they've done a good job of doing that. Continuing with questions from individuals in the full court press program. You have a follow up on the right and then we'll come to the center. So speaking about balance again, my next question is you're playing on this big stage, which is the final four, obviously. And you're in this situation where, yes, you want to execute and win this, these next two games, like I've already said. But at the same time, you're in the final four. So it's like, you got to be grateful for it, man. So have you been able to find that balance between just being grateful of just being here and soaking up everything, but at the same time, yeah, just still focusing in on what's at hand? Yeah, for us, I think we've all talked about right now we're, we're on a business trip. Uh, yeah, it's great. You want to enjoy it. You see your families get to enjoy all the fans here. And it's really special. You don't want to take it for granted. But uh, at the same time, like Coach said, we're going to be 
we're going to be uh, uh, past players and for 50 years. We got we can we got all the time in the world to enjoy it. So making sure we're locked in and making the most of it, and making sure we're ready for tip off come Saturday. In the second row on the right. Hi, James Morrell from Arizona State. Uh, Purdue has been no stranger to success, making it their ninth consecutive appearance here in the tournament. Uh, but in the prior eight seasons, you haven't quite made it to this point. What has been the separator between those eight seasons and now? Um, obviously playing better um, at, at key times. Um, you know, a lot comes to matchups. You know, for us, our losses have been uh, to more to low to mid-major teams. So that's something like you like you take a hard look at. Um, at at the end of every year, you know, you take inventory of yourself, your staff, your players, your style, what works, what doesn't work. And I don't like to think in theory. I like to crunch it and get it figured out. And it's no different than a hypothesis, right? Like you're, you're, you're trying to confirm what your hypothesis is, is true. And like, but you can't sit there and have a bias towards it or you're gonna slant it, right? So just allowing it to come to, you, you know, collaborate with analytical people, like looking at different things. Um, for me, as the season progressed, um, I just felt like I had to play more offensive guys. I think that allows us more spacing with Zach. That allows Braden Smith to navigate through ball screens better. And then it allows the people that do have skill, they have a decision to make. So if you just want to take Fletcher away, you just gave Zach and Braden more space. If you don't and you want to shrink from that, you just gave him opportunities to shoot the basketball and play in the closeouts and get the angles, which is definitely going to help him. Uh, just using him as an example, obviously I'm not going to go through everybody on our team. But that for us um, was always like just like being honest, like being honest with myself and saying like where can I make some, some moves here. And a lot of times it's personnel too. So I think we added some athleticism, we added some quickness, and that helped us. Um, Lance Jones helped us, Cam Heidi helps us, Miles Colvin helps us. Um, but yet a couple of them don't play a lot. But yet when they do, they really give us that spark um, with that. So I think that's been um, a real key for us there. We've been able to get to that second weekend. We've only gotten to the Elite Eight game twice. Um, both times I think we've had really good offensive teams. But yet we got beat by a 16 seed and we had a really, we had a top, I think five or six offensive team. But um, we turned the basketball over too. So like you go through all those things and at the end of the day, I'm like, don't turn the ball over. So analytical people talk, you hire new people, you chew on something, you spend three to four weeks doing different things to get it figured out. And then at the end of the day, just tell Fletch, don't, uh, don't turn the ball over. Like, Braden, don't turn the ball over. Zach, don't turn the ball over. That's what I get to. And when we don't turn the basketball over, we're 27-0. and 0. And obviously, we have really good players, too. I, I think that's more important than my, my words. Likely our final question on the right side. Um, I know some players, they listen to music before getting on the court and warming up. I mean, do you have any kind of music taste that you prefer to listen to on the court during warm-ups? Yeah, I kind of like to switch it up. Uh, everybody's got kind of their own thing. I usually kind of listen to like country to get me calmed down a little bit, um, where I'd say most guys probably listen to rap to get them going for the game. Any final questions from the Full Court Press program? On the right side, up front. Yeah, my bad, man. I'll keep on asking questions. But last question, or hopefully. Anyways, I wanted to ask you personally, since you've been here, you mentioned you've been here for three weeks now. Not here, but just in the tournament, obviously, for three weeks. So, since you've been in the tournament, what's been your favorite moment so far? Inside the game or even outside the game? Yeah, I, I have two. I'd say uh, hearing that buzzer against Tennessee, uh, knowing all the work we put in, we got to the Final Four, one of our goals uh, start of the year, something that we worked really hard to do that obviously we get, didn't get to do last year. So, that and then coming home off the air, airplane in uh, West Lafayette, seeing all those fans there on a Sunday night, it, it means a lot to us. Uh, we know us playing hard and us winning games, uh, they like that. They cheer us on, they support us, win or loss. So kind of putting on a show for them and them uh, welcoming us when we got back. Coach, did you have a favorite moment from the last few weeks that anything stands out? Uh, obviously winning against Tennessee to go to the Final Four, just, uh, you know, that it, it's a relief, to be honest with you. Like, obviously, you want to cherish the moment. And then for Coach Katie, I, that was uh, – that, that was cool for him. He deserved a coach in the Final Four, and he wasn't able to do that. But, you know, him being a part of this is, is, is pretty cool. 
So do you have any moments of living with Coach Katie and you want to share? Uh, that's all the time we have for this session. But we want to thank Fletcher Lawyer. We want to thank Coach Painter. We'll do a separate Coach Katie news conference uh, after hours. The action continues here in the main interview room with the USVWA Player of the Year. You may know who this already is. We're going to have representatives from the USVWA join us on the dais in just a moment, along with the Oscar Robertson Trophy winner for 2023-24. Uh, brighter and hotter than you the main interview room by the winner of the Oscar Robertson Trophy, that's the U.S. Basketball Writers Association Player of the Year, Zach Eady, and the president currently serving from the athletic, Brendan Quinn. Brendan? Thank you, Mark. Four more days, and then I'm, I'm out of here. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brendan Quinn. It is an honor uh, to be up here representing the USBWA, a organization with 68 years of history covering a game that we all love. Um, it's also an honor to be up here with Zach, who I imagine is getting tired of awards. If there's such a thing to be tired of winning awards, I think Zach has to at least be testing the theory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think I speak for all writers when I say we have run out of ways to describe your talent and your stature and to celebrate um, what you've given to the sport of college basketball. Um, perhaps even more impressive than those attributes and all the awards and all the stats um, is the burden upon Zach that goes mostly unseen. Uh, being the face of college basketball is beyond demanding, and it's hard to imagine anyone doing it better than Zach Eady. Uh, last week in a story by my colleague, uh, your teammate Ethan Moore said this of you. Everybody wants to be that guy, but there's also a lot of stuff, he did not say stuff, that comes with it, and nobody gets that. I don't think people understand what he has to deal with and the weight he carries on his shoulders. He has a master's degree in dealing with stuff. Um, Zach, you were also on the stage last year, a double dip, AP Player of the Year, USBWA Player of the Year, um, but this year feels so much more fitting because you are here with your team, you are here with your uniform, uh, and you are ready to play in Purdue's first national semifinal in 44 years and potentially lead the Boilermakers to their first national championship in school history. And he will do so as a two-time Oscar Robertson Award Trophy winner. Congrats, Zach. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Are you the Yes, I am. Uh, it's, it's been a, a great year, uh, not only for me personally, but for me, uh, like for Purdue. Uh, like we, we, we've had a great year up to this point. I can't complain. Um, kind of the way I'm, I'm so proud of my teammates, the way that, that they bounced back this year, um, the way that they, like you, you say, I have a weight on my shoulders, but they, they do too. Um, like, let's not get that mistaken. Uh, and the way that they've kind of handled that and the way that they've, they've, um, 
succeeded in that role. Uh, I, I'm super proud of them, and the, like, I wouldn't be here without them. Uh, the Braden's helped me so much. The ledge, like, like everything. Like they, they give me room to work in the game. They give me that space. Braden sets me up. Like uh, I'm, I'm so proud of like the way that, that they they responded from last year, and, and uh, obviously we're we're here and we're still playing. We still we have still have more games to go. Like we're not done by any means, but. Uh, just up to this point, like I, I, the way that they responded, like like grown men, um, I'm so happy for them. Just a housekeeping note: if you'd like to roll video on this press conference, it's one of the news conferences where you can do so. So feel free to do that. If you have a question for Zach, please raise your hand. Let's go to Adam, and then we'll go to Matt. Adam Zagoria from NJ.com. Congratulations. Um, I just want to ask you about NIL stuff. I know you've been doing some posts with this DAPS. Um, uh, social media posts. Can you just kind of talk about how easy it is for athletes like you to maybe make some money doing those posts and, you know, when do you do them? Like before games, after games, how do you take the time to do it? And just your overall thoughts on, on NIL benefiting players like yourself. Well, I'm, I'm probably a bad person to ask about that uh, just because the uh, since I'm a, a foreign student, uh, obviously I have those kind of like NIL issues and uh, uh, visa issues. Um, so I, like, like I'll try to do some stuff when I when I can. Uh, when I'm back in Toronto, I'll try to do some stuff. Um, like obviously, I can still do like jersey sales and stuff while I'm here, like the, that passive income stuff. But it's not like I can I can like go film a commercial in, in West Lafayette. So I don't, I don't think I'm the best person to really ask about that. Let's get Adam a microphone for the fellow. You were able to do some of those DAPS posts when was that just when you were in Canada or when you yeah, were here too? Just when I was in Canada. Yeah. Do you think it's unfair that international students can't benefit from NIL? Yeah, uh, for sure. I hope they change it in the future. Um, I think, like obviously, I've lost out on a lot of money this year. Um, but like at the end of the day, like I'm not. It, it needs to change for sure. Uh, I understand kind of the legal process takes a while, and, and when you're actually trying to change like a, I don't, like it's not like it's an NCAA rule, like it's an American law. Um, so when you try to go about changing that, I understand it takes a while, but uh, yeah, I do think it needs to get changed. Two quick ones, and then we'll get Zach to practice. Matt in the back of the room on the left. Matt Norlander, CBS Sports. Zach, you were the best player in the sport last year. You're the best player in the sport this year. Was it more difficult getting to that point a year ago, or was it more difficult sustaining it and what you've been able to do over the past five months? Um, well, I mean, both seasons presented their own kind of challenges, obviously. Like, last year, um, like, last year we kind of came from that, that team that no one expected anything from. Um, like, we weren't supposed to make, like, if we made a tournament last year, it was going to be a good year, and then kind of have all the success that we had um, in that season, and then for me to have that personal success, that, that, like, that was a big challenge. Like, kind of just, um, I had never been in that, that, that focal point of an offense role, so kind of being in that last year and accepting that and, and working out all the problems that come with it um, was the challenge. And this year, it's just kind of been like like playing with that, that like everybody like everybody wants to play against me. Everybody wants that to play against me. Like I got that target on my back, so kind of accepting that that as it's a it's a privilege to have that. Um, like they don't they don't do that for everybody. Um, you know, like only great players and great teams kind of get that target. So kind of accepting that. Um, and then like dealing with that, and then some of like the like the other stuff. Um, it, like they like I said, they both kind of like they both really presented their own unique challenges. I don't know if one was was harder than the other. Final question up front. Zach Greg Moore, Arizona Republic. I understand the frustrations with NIL for you, and that doesn't sound fair. I'm wondering what kind of deals you've heard of that your teammates have been able to capitalize on, some things that you maybe think you've passed up. Just some of the cooler, funnier, more interesting NIL deals that you've seen that you maybe wished you could have been a part of. Um, I mean, I kind of just try to stay out of that for the most part. I have like, kind of my age to deal with that. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm a basketball player at the end of the day, so that's really what I'm focused on. Um, Especially when I can't even like make the NIL deals, I don't I only want to hear about them. Um, to be honest, um, so it's just kind of like I haven't really heard about too many of them. So I try to stay away from that. 
We'd like to thank Zach and congratulate him once again. Two-time Oscar Robertson Trophy winner, Zach and Purdue, will be headed out to open practice in just a few moments. Thanks, everybody. Uh, in terms of traffic, everyone, at noon, which is in four minutes, the Alabama locker room will open for student-athlete availability. We'll also have five of the Crimson Tide starters here in the breakout areas, led by intrepid breakout moderator Scott Kuykendall and the rest of our breakout moderators. Uh, my right, your left, will have student-athlete availability for the five Crimson Tide starters. Other student-athletes will be available in the locker room. The locker room is open from 12 to 12.45. The breakout sessions go from 12 to 12.25. And we'll have Coach Oates here at 12.15 until 12.45. And we'll be joined by a Alabama student athlete uh, about midway through. We'll see you right back here or in the open locker room or in the breakouts in the next couple of moments. Please do. Who's coming from Alabama? I've got to talk to my dad approach. He's a huge French fan. Is the French influence on that stuff? Yeah, a lot of it.
I'm down to see it, I'm down to stay and watch.
I was from and I was in Arizona State weekend. This was
Good afternoon, everyone. We hope you're all enjoying the Alabama Open Locker Room session as well as the student athlete breakouts. In just a moment, we'll have the head coach, Nate Oates, join us down here in the main interview room. After a 15 minute question and answer period, we'll have student athlete Mark Sears jump in as well. And then we'll begin to take questions for our full court press program. So for those not in the full court press program, you'll want to get your questions in in the first 15 minutes of the news conference because the full court press program will take over for the second 15 minutes. Doesn't mean you have to leave. You're welcome to stay and enjoy the answers, but not the questions. Well, joining us here in the main interview room, just a reminder to silence your cell phone. I'm gonna do that with mine now. No flash photography in the main interview room. Uh, the locker room is open again until 1245. Student athlete breakouts continue until about 1225. No video recording during this news conference. That includes handheld cameras, mini cameras, mobile phones, camera phones, etc. You can take still photos, but please refrain from using a flash. At the end of the news conference, we'll have transcripts almost immediately and video is available for download and it's going live around the world via satellite. We have four microphone stewards in the room. They'll make their way over to you if you have a question. Please state your name and media outlet before you present your question to all of our coaches and student athletes this afternoon. Nate Oates, head coach of Alabama, in just a moment. Bob, I think the volume's up on the TV over here. Nate Oates joins us now. He's the head coach at the University of Alabama. Coach, we'll ask that you open things with a statement, then we'll take some questions. We uh, had a good practice yesterday. We made, made it through injury-free, so I think we'll, uh, we, as long as we can get through today's uh, practice injury-free, we should be healthy for the first time in a while, and we're going to need to be healthy. We're going to need use our depth against uh, UConn, but I, I like where our guys, our heads are at. Obviously, we're big underdogs. We know that UConn's uh, very good. They, you know, they, they've they been running through the competition, but I, I don't think our guys are scared. I think our guys are are confident in their abilities, and we're getting healthy. We'll be ready. We know it's going to be a tough game, but I think we've had good game plans going into the last uh, – few games here in the tournament. Our guys are doing a good job executing them. I think we'll have a uh, solid game plan. I think our guys are going to be pretty locked into what we have to do to get uh, to get this thing done on Saturday. Coach, our first question comes up front on the right side of the room. Blake Byler, BamaCentral.com. Nate, obviously getting to the Final Four is a huge accomplishment and, and something that y'all were striving for, but how do you shift from uh, getting that accomplishment to now looking towards accomplishing something else and chasing a championship? You know, we, we talked about at the beginning of the year, you know, our goal was to win championships. We, we didn't win the SEC regular season this year. We'd won that two out of the last three years. You know, we had a shot at it, lost the, the home game to Tennessee and the road game to Florida, which, you know, we didn't win that. Had a shot to win a tournament championship, which we'd what, done two out of the last three years, didn't win that. Now. Here's a chance to win the, the biggest championship out of all of them. So, while well, I don't want to take anything away from making a Final Four because it's special, it's something that's never been done in school history, but there's still two games to be played, and the biggest championship of all is still sitting in front of us, and, and we need to get locked in and play it. So, let, let's not discount the fact we've made a Final Four. That's a big deal, but we're still playing for a championship. We've got two games left to win the biggest one of all, and, and that's where our mindset's at right now. Second row on the right side, same area of the room, Coach. 
Coach Joe Gaither, BamaCentral.com. The last couple of weeks, you've really accredited Mark Sears' leadership as being the catalyst for this run. Could you elaborate on maybe what he's doing differently or what he's doing more of in the leadership department that you think has uh, really uh, uh, driven the team to this point? You know what, I think he's done a better job uh, encouraging his teammates, um, talking in the huddles. You know, we, we, we got to get stops. You know, he comes in, he's, he's a lot more vocal. You know, I think a lot of guys, maybe it's not their nature to be as vocal. You know, they kind of let their play kind of lead the way, if you will. But but you've got to do more than that if you want to be a real leader. They, 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 there's no option. You have to be vocal. You have to speak up. You have to inspire your guys. He's, he's become more vocal. He's talking in timeouts. He's talking in huddles. You know, he's making sure that he knows what the scouting report is so that he can really talk through with some of these younger guys what we have to do. So I think a lot of the more vocal, inspiring, making holding guys accountable stuff he's been a lot better at. Coach, up front on the left, second row. Robert O'Connell, Wall Street Journal. Nate, over the last couple of years, UConn's gone from a solid offense to one of the top offenses in the country. Just in your scout, what is what accounts for that uptick? Like, what's gotten to them to this premier level these last couple of years? You know what? I, I know Danny fairly well, as it's well documented, and I, I've had discussions with him. You know, they're, they're you know, we're obviously very analytics driven. They are too. You know, they, they take a lot of threes. They don't take too many tough mid-range you know you look at their shot chart it's it's pretty similar to ours now they're they're at the rim shots they get a lot more post-ups than we do but I think you know their shot geography if you will has become pretty clean with a lot of paint shots threes they get to the free throw line you know and I think that Danny's got a, a good feel for what he wants their identity to be. You know, we played them last year up at, in Portland at uh, the PK 85 or PKI, whatever it was, you know, and, and they, 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 they do a really good job playing through a pretty dominant post player and getting their shooters wide open looks and, and not really settling for bad shots. They have no problem going deep into the clock to make sure that they get the shot that they want and are looking for, and he's got all kinds of different sets to get the types of shots they're looking for. The other thing they do a good job of is a guy gets hot, you know, Spencer hits a three, they're probably going to run play for Spencer next time down. He, he, do, he does a, a great job of controlling who gets the shots, and they're going to have their better players are going to get shots that are in their areas that they can make them. And I think he, he's done a really good job of that. And he's gotten really good players, obviously. His recruiting's gone well. But you can get really good players and not put them in the, the right spots. He's got really good players and putting them in the right spots to, to get efficient shots. Coach, that same area, second row. Hey, Coach. Hey, Coach. Blake Neiman, Sun Devil Source. Uh, I was talking to Bobby Hurley the other day, and he said you guys have stayed in touch since your guys' time together at Buffalo. Um, what has your guys' interactions been like through the years, and how impactful was he in preparing you for your first head coaching gig? Yeah, I, we've definitely stayed in touch. I mean, I I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him giving me a shot. So I, I you know, feel like he's a mentor of mine. You know, he's one of the best point guards to ever play. I, I learned a lot about point guard play in the two years I was with him which the way that we want to play, we've had great guard play. We've done a pretty good job putting guards into the NBA and I feel like I did learn a lot in those two years. You know, I, we, we've stayed in touch on different things throughout the years. You know, we've kind of stayed in touch on, he's had some really good teams. You know, we've talked about them. We've sometimes one of, one of us is on a losing streak, kind of, pump the other one up. We, we always see each other on the recruiting trail. You know, how's recruiting going? When we played Arizona here, they allowed us to use their gym to, to practice in. You know, and then obviously, we both got the connection with Danny. It's his brother, and I've known Danny for a long time, and Danny's been pretty successful, so we'll 
text text on some of Danny's games too on on some of that stuff. So, you know, di- different different things, different areas. You know, just kind of touching base on basketball related uh, things throughout the years. And yeah, I mean, you know, he coached him and his brother both coach super intense, and I, I I'm not sure I'm quite at the level of intensity those two guys carry on on the sideline but but we're pretty intense as well and I, I think that there's a reason that their families won big in basketball at, at all levels and I you know kind of learn how to I ah, shoot I learned a lot of drills from Bobby and I think you know he got them from his dad and from his brother and we still use a lot of the drills I learned from Bobby just they're good I shoot his, his dad probably his best drills and in basketball, and the two of those, uh, you know, Danny and Bobby learned a lot from their dad, and I, I was able to learn a little bit, a lot from from Bobby and you know Danny as well. In the center of the room, Zach, New York Post. Th- three of the four coaches here were high school coaches, like you were. How how do you think that important is? How important is that for someone once you get to this level? And, you know, you always hear about there's so many great high school coaches who never do get that shot. Uh, what was it like for you also when you did finally get that shot? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think there's a lot of really good high school coaches. I went against them up in Metro Detroit area, and, you know, I've gotten to know a lot of them. Should I, I still steal drills when I go on recruiting trips to see different high school coaches work. I mean, I, I've been fortunate enough to go into some pretty good high school coaches' practices. I, I think... You know, I was fortunate. I got some breaks, and Bobby gave me my first break. If it wasn't for Bobby giving me that break, I, I wouldn't be here. And I think there's a lot of really good high school coaches that just never got a break. And, you know, it's it's unfortunate, but there's only so many jobs out there. And, you know, you, it's hard. You can't – everybody's not going to get a break. So you kind of got to uh, be ready for your breaks if they come. It, it's, it is pretty cool that three of the four of us were high school coaches and not that long ago. I mean, 11 years ago, I was a high school coach. It wasn't too long before that that, you know, Danny made the jump straight from St. Benedict's to Wagner. And then, you know, Keats was uh, moved from high school to a college assistant a little bit more like I did and then was able to get a head job at Wilmington. And I, I, think, it, I think it's pretty cool. That three high school, get, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of high school coaches out there looking at this Final Four, you know, wondering if they can get a break. And I just tell them keep keep working, be ready for a break if it comes. And you know, sometimes you got to make your breaks. But I, I think it's I think it's cool. I think it shows you uh, that you know there's coaches at all levels. That should I've got a coach on my staff I hired that, that kind of high school. Over in Europe, he had never coached Division One basketball before. I hired him last year, and he's done a really good job for me. So the, I think you can make hires from all different areas and levels. It's, it, does the guy know basketball? Is he passionate about it? Is, does he work hard at it? Like that, that's more what I'm looking for in hiring assistants. And I think you know maybe this Final Four helps some ADs see that they, they can think outside the box maybe a little bit more. Up front on the left side. Chase Goodbread with the Tuscaloosa News. Coach, question about Nick Pringle. Um, last week after the Clemson game, I think he cited his leadership and felt like he, he had an inspiring performance for the, for the team. And, of course, like six or eight weeks ago, it looked like it was touch and go whether or not he would be on the team. Can you just speak to the transformation that he's made mentally, and do you think his relationship with Scotty Hollins has had a lot to do with that? It's a good question. It, it kind of it's ironic that question comes after the high school question because I, I go back you know sometimes some guys need some maturity and just need to grow a little bit and I being a high school coach for 11 years I saw a lot of young men change whether it's over the course of one year or over the course of four years and I think you know I, I never would give up on a kid in high school there was a kid that I kicked off the team his junior year in high school that ended up moving in with me that spring because I, I brought him back and never let him play the rest of his junior year. But I brought him back in a program because I was afraid of where he'd end up if he didn't have basketball. So while, you know, he did something significant enough to be done with 
the team. He couldn't, didn't play any more games the rest of his junior year. But uh, Valdez Green was his name, went by Vinny. Vinny ended up being in a tough spot. He moved in with me that spring, stayed with me all spring, summer, the next year, played for me his senior year, got him in a junior college, came back, stayed with me on his senior breaks. Like, you see guys change, and especially, like, the high school level I was at. So, like, to, to answer your question about Pringle, I think he has changed a lot. I think he – sometimes they have to see things from a different perspective. And, you know, one of the question, one of the statements he made to me when he'd come back from, you know, he got suspended. I think that's what you're referring to six to eight weeks ago is I didn't realize what a distraction I was to my teammates. And his big thing is he's, he's always wanted to be there for his teammates, and he has been. He's been a, a good teammate, but he didn't realize some of the – stuff he's doing was a distraction to him and he didn't want to be that I think you know tr Scotty's traveled with us all year Scotty started traveling with us last year with the kind of the adversity we went through and Scotty's been a, a great mentor to Nick great mentor to a lot of our guys I think Scotty helps Nick stay grounded you know Nick's very vocal very got a great personality he got natural leadership about him just need to make sure he's leading the right way and I think these last few weeks six to eight weeks you know he's he's made big changes and he's leading us the right way and he's got this great infectious personality about him that when you get him leading the right way like he can really be a great leader and I think he's a big part of why we made this run here in the NCAA tournament midway back on the left Hey, Coach, Jonah Krell, Arizona PBS, Cronkite News. Um, I was talking to some of your players yesterday about how personable you are. Grant uh, going golfing with you, Sam having a dinner just with you. Um, and I know you're a teacher at heart, so how, how have you learned to balance being a friend and being relatable with your players but also being tough on them and being able to coach them? Yeah, I, I think, again, I said it yesterday, I wouldn't trade my path for anything. I think being a high school coach helps me in that regard. We... I, the high school job I had wasn't one of these they could pay you a bunch of money to just be the basketball coach. Yeah, no, I had to actually teach a full-time teaching load. I was teaching <coughs> five hours of math at Romulus, so I typically had, you know, I taught Algebra one, I taught Geometry, so I had freshmen, I had sophomores, and I taught Statistics, so then I had juniors or seniors, so I literally had my players dang near every year like from their freshman year up through in math classes so you know and I'd have a freshman kid so it was easier to build relationships with my players in high school because I get them every day in class even in the off season so I, I in a college you have to create different ways to build it with them outside the basketball floor you know like in high school I mean, I remember E.C. Matthews, big name here, because that's how I really got to know the Hurleys. But E.C.'s mom went on a cruise the fall of his senior year, and she bought him a ticket and assumed he was going to go, and he, he didn't want to go because he's going to miss practice for a week. So the only way she agreed to leave him home was if he stayed with me. I was like, yeah, come on, he can stay with me. So he stayed in my house for a week, and... <laughs> You know, it's different things like that. Vinny lives with me permanently for a couple of years. You know, you have the whole team over for barbecue. You have the whole team over to shoot some pool. So, you know, I, I made sure my house and I, I've got a, a little nice game room where I've got pool table, ping pong table, got an Xbox. You know, so I, I like to have the guys over now in college. It's a little different because they're not going to come over all the time. In high school, it's a little, you know, you put food on the table. Uh, in high school, they're going to come. Like in college, they got a lot more resources. You can't just entice them with some food. Or, But I, I like to, to hang out with them off the court. You know, enough, we've got to – look, when I got to Alabama, they, they had a pool table up, but apparently it didn't get used much, at least not by the coaching staff. So I've established myself as uh, number one on the pool the, the billiards, you know, everybody else can work down. Scotty Hollins, our team chaplains, uh, we got an ongoing uh, running tally on, on my head right now. He's probably the second best pool player, but we've also got a ping pong table in there. We got shuffleboard table in there. I, I, it, it's easy to 
interact with guys on things like that. I've gone golfing with Grant. I, I uh, got a, I put a simulator in my house like a year ago because I stink at golf and I, just, I can go down and hit ball. I'm still, I still stink. I'm terrible. But I think when I went with Grant, I, I think I beat him by like one. Like now he, he's, he can hit it a long ways. He's a little inconsistent like me. I don't hit it near as long as him, but I think I beat him by one. But we, I remember I think I had like Sam over there hitting on the simulator. He's, I got a video on my phone of him hitting at the Fan Fest yesterday. He, three strikes, he was out. He missed the ball entirely three straight times. It looks similar to on my simulator. But I think when you're able to hang out with the guys a little bit, do some fun stuff, shoot, we're, the week, I think the day before we uh, left for the tournament, we had everybody out and went. They've got a new pop stroke mini golf thing in Tuscaloosa. We took the whole team out to that. Just get away, don't talk basketball, hang out, let them see as a, a real person. Uh, I, think, I think it works a little bit. So, yeah, we try to do some of that type of stuff. We're going to welcome in March Sears, and we're going to start to transition to our full, full court quest press questions, but we're going to take one all the way back and all the way left. Hey, Coach. Brett Greenberg, Bama 247. I know you can't get specifics, but just from a recruiting perspective, what do you think this Final Four appearance does for you guys going forward? Does the recruiting pitch change? Todd, talk about that for a second. It certainly doesn't hurt. I mean, most ki if, if kids don't want to be a part of a winning team, I probably don't want to, I probably don't want to take them. So, you know, we, we've had one of the more, what would I say, modern – Offenses, one of the more recruitable two offenses in the country over the last five years. You know, we, we've done a, you know, we did a study. We've improved our guys' draft stock more than anybody in the country has over the last five years since we've been there. So we've got the NBA deal. We've had more lottery picks than anybody in the country. We've got the offense going. We've won at a high level. I think since we've, since I got to the uh, SEC, they've given out nine trophies. I think we have four of them. You know, there's five regular season, four tournament. They didn't have the tournament my first year. I think we've got four. Kentucky's got one. Tennessee's got two. Auburn's got two. So we've won those championships. We've got an offense. We put guys in the pros. Now we're competing on a national stage in the Final Four to win a national championship. So there's not a lot missing in the recruiting pitch now. So... Preston's a big-time recruiter, and he's certainly using this uh, Final Four on our advantage for sure, and we'll, we'll see what type of dividends uh, we can gain from it uh, moving forward to spring and summer. Back in the room, just to the right of the aisle, White Polo, thank you. Hey, Coach. Mike Miller, Field of 68 Daily. I asked Mark yesterday if there was such a thing as too many threes in a game. Now, you've run the calculus. You tell me, I'm, I'm sure... Dan knows the calculus too. Is there such a thing as too many threes? No. It, it all depends on how the defense wants to guard us. I think you go back to our Purdue game, what did we shoot, 46, if I remember correct? Like, I, I don't really care. We'll shoot 50 in a game if, uh, if that's how they want to guard us. And, you know, if they want to take the paint away, we'll take threes. If they want to take the threes away, we'll take the paint. Now, UConn presents a little bit of challenge because they've got Klingon that kind of roam the paint. I'm sure they're going to try to run us off the three-point line. So, you know, most games there's a pretty good mix of threes and paint shots. But, no, nah, there's no max. I mean, shoot, we've made – my first year we set the SEC record for threes made in a game. We made 22 at Auburn. We broke that record, made 23 in a game. We've hit 20-plus, <clears throat> I think, five different times. Can't make 20 if you're not taking – 40, 50 of them, so let, it, let them fly. We're going to take some full court press questions. Let's go to the second row. All right. Hi, I'm James Morrell from ASU. Uh, Coach, you kind of touched on this earlier in the press conference, so Mark, if you want to answer this. You talked about how uh, it's important to be here and the job's not done, but not to downplay the fact that this is your first appearance in the Final Four, your program's first appearance. Which is, what does that mean to you, to be here on the stage? 
Go ahead, Mike. That's for you. Uh, I already answered uh, it before you got here. He, he didn't listen to the question. He said that. All right. So, uh, being, having a first program appearance, you know, it's uh, very special and uh, to soak it all in, you know, but uh, we didn't come here just to have a just to be satisfied of making the Final Four, you know, we obviously, we have goals and ambitions to win the whole thing. Next full court press question is just to the left of the aisle. Back right microphone. Your left. Front, front right microphone now. Hi, my name is Adriana Lubadri. Um So I have, so Alabama's full of traditions from Rammer Jammer. I mean, do you guys have any traditions within the locker room, any superstitions that kind of go on that you guys have? Mark, you want to take some uh, traditions, superstitions first, then coach? Uh, I don't I don't say we have like any traditions with the Rum and Drummond, but uh, I do personally. I love going there, you know, very good breakfast spot. I uh, also go there occasionally for lunch. She's asking about do we have any traditions like in the locker room or before the game or any superstitions we have uh, to do this before the game starts or something? Uh, we just play our, we play our music and, you know, we, we say a team prayer before we uh, walk out the game. It'd be a good question for uh, Lamika Sears. Oh, yeah. She's got a few superstitions, I'm guessing. Yeah. <laughs> we go down to the front and center. Hey, what's going on? Jalen Weathers. Um, I got a question for you personally, Mark. Just knowing that you're a student right now, y'all been away for like two, three weeks now. Has it been difficult for you and I guess just really your teammates in general for balancing just that schoolwork along with just focusing on what's at stake right here? Uh, I say, uh, I say we love it. We love traveling and we love being away from the school and especially to do play basketball without having to go to do school work. So you know, we we love what we're doing. <laughs> we we also travel our academic coordinator with us on these long trips. So Brittany's on these guys' mandatory study halls, but the, the school does a good job making sure we've got tutors on Zooms and they're, they're still doing their schoolwork. Continuing with questions for those in the full court press program, we're going to use the front left microphone, but we're going to go to the right. My name is Melody. I'm from Arizona State University. Um, I guess this is kind of a question for both of you. So, Mark, you're coming from Ohio University, and now you're here as a transfer, and you're making it to the Final Four with Alabama for the first time in history. Obviously, that's got to feel amazing. What do you think that the transfer portal has benefited the team for getting to the Final Four, um, and how do you plan on using that momentum you have right now to continue your career and your lifelong as a former athlete, if that makes sense? Mm, I say uh, when I went to transfer portal, it was all about the right fit, and you know I felt like Alabama was a perfect fit for me because of the style that they uh, we play, and you know um, I feel like that'd be very good for uh, future transfer portal commits to come here. Coach, any thoughts on the transfer portal to, as a follow-up? Yeah, I mean, we've obviously used it. You look at our uh, rotation, we've got a lot of guys that came out of the transfer portal, I think, used appropriately. You can build a good roster, and then, you know, you've got to be cognizant of the fact that you want these guys to graduate, so you've got to make sure that their credits transfer in, you get them in the right programs, they can still get their college degree. That, that's the one issue I see with just being able to openly transfer whenever you want is if you, you're transferring multiple times and credits don't transfer, can you get them to graduate in the appropriate time where they finish their playing career and graduate at the same time? Mark's on track to graduate this spring. So, you know, I think we've done a good job. All the graduates, or I'm sorry, all the transfers we take have taken this year or on, pass to gra or on pace to graduate at the right time. But, yeah, I mean, you know, for Mark to – you know, Aaron Estrada from Hofstra out of Grant Nelson from North Dakota State. I mean, you know, if, if you're able to prove it at a level that maybe you got under-recruited out of high school, there's no reason if you get under-recruited out of high school that you can't then play your way up to play on the biggest stage. And we've got Mark, Grant, Aaron, Latrell Reitzel, Nick Pringle started at Wofford. You know, you kind of go down the list. Like, these guys are now playing on the biggest stage. And I think if you prove yourself, you know, let's keep in mind that we're still here to educate the guys as long as they get their degree. I'm, I'm not opposed to the transfer portal. We, we used it to create this roster, and I think it's done well for the, the individual guys themselves as well. Back up front and to the center. 
So for you, Mark, how has it been going from the MAC to the SEC? Like, I'm, I play football in the MAC. I play at Eastern Michigan University, so I know a little bit about the MAC. So knowing that MAC sometimes, you know, it, get, it can get a little disrespect. You feel me? So knowing that you went from the MAC now to the SEC, how has that transition been for you personally? I said uh, the guard play in the MAC is uh, very similar to the SEC. You know, they have, we have great guards in the MAC, and then uh, the only thing difference would be the big play. You know, there's not going to be a five man in the MAC that can switch onto a point guard and stay in front. I say that's really the biggest difference between uh, the MAC and the SEC because the SEC you got uh, versatile big guys that can stay in front of the guards. He didn't play in the MAC when I was in the MAC because we had a versatile big guy that would have stayed in front of him. I think. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Continuing with full court press questions, if there are any. We'll go to the third row. Back right, Mike. Hi, my name is James Lotz. I'm with ASU. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, obviously tomorrow's the first time Alabama will be in the Final Four, and that's a big game. I just wanted to ask how you kind of handle the nerves going in and don't let the game get too big for yourself. I say just take it like it's any other game, you know, just more more people watching, you know. That's, that's the fun about it, just being able to – play for the University of Alabama and just just know this game has meaning and you're not just playing for yourself. Did you have a follow-up up front? We have time for one more. So, yeah, last question, man. How has it been being able to, like, you're on this big stage now, so knowing that you're on this big stage and it's the Final Four and those opportunities rarely come, better yet, even for y'all program. So knowing that y'all have this unique opportunity, how have you been able to find the balance between just seeing what's at stake, seeing that you gotta focus on the moment, but at the same time, just taking a step back to just be grateful for where you're at and just take a step back to just literally soak everything in? I really, uh, that, uh, when we when we first landed, you know, that's when we started to soak everything in because, you know, they were celebrating us and we got to see the, the trophy and people were handing us gifts and stuff. And I say it really stopped when we just started watching film. You know, we just we realized that we're here and we're not here to be satisfied just because we made it. You know, we want to prove more people wrong. And that's what we that's what we stand. We'll take one more from Full Court Press. Hello, my name is Josh from ASU, um, for Coach Nate. What lessons can you take from your time um, coaching high school that you could apply now, whether it's practically or anything like that? Yeah, I, I think on some levels, coaching is coaching. You've got to have relationships with your players because part of coaching is motivating them to play hard. I think if they don't trust you, if they don't believe in what you're telling them, they're, they're not going to play at the same level they need to. So I think you got to build trust with your players. you got to be super knowledgeable. I think even coaches that build great relationships with their players, if they don't study the game and know what they're talking about, they lose trust. So relationships, trust, you got to have it all. Like you can't just – and you don't need to be their friend to build a relationship. I can have a, a really good relationship with them without – I'm, I'm not going to – you know, I'm almost 50 years old. I'm not going to be like hanging out with Mark on, on the weekends. He's going to do some different stuff. But I can have a great relationship with him. I, I felt like when I was a high school coach, I wanted to be the hardest working coach in the state of Michigan so that I could build their trust. You know, I, I told, I had an assistant, a long time assistant, Josh Baker, who went and took over his own program and won a bunch of state championships at Southfield Christian. But I, I used to tell him, if all we're doing is just teaching these guys how to put a round ball through a ring, we're wasting an awful lot of time. But if I can be the best coach they've had to where I get their respect, so then I can teach them I had grown to be a young man on a lot of other areas. You know, they, they respect you if, if they know you put the work in to make them better at what they're trying to do. And then you can use that to teach them life lessons and a lot of things. I think the same thing goes now. I mean, if they know I'm lazy and I don't know what I'm talking about, like, I, they're not going to respect me as a coach, as a man. So let, let's be the hardest working guy, the most prepared coaches we can possibly be. You, you earn their respect. You treat them with respect. There's a way to gotten on Mark over this year. We need him to guard a little better. We need him to play a little harder, and he's gotten it. But you can get on him without being disrespectful and have a relationship with them, get their respect, build it, get them to play hard. All of that's pretty similar, high school, college, all that. So uh, those are the, 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 the biggest lessons in coaching I think I was able to learn at a high school level. Now, 
tweaking game plans X and O. Obviously, the higher you get up, the more information you have, the more you're able to do a little bit of that, the better that can go. But the, the crux of it, if you can't build a relationship, garner respect from your team, like high school, college, NBA, it doesn't matter, like you're not going to be a very good coach. We want to thank Coach Oates and thank Mark Sears for joining us here in the main interview room. Alabama's going to head to open practice out on the floor in just a few moments. Wasn't taking first. It's now twelve forty nine at one PM. The Yukon locker room will open for student athlete access and availability. That's from 1 to 145. Also at 1 p.m., we're going to have five student athletes from Yukon in the breakout areas to my right and your left. We'll have individual student athlete breakout news conferences over there in that part of the room. And at 115, head coach Dan Hurley will join us here in this room for a 15-minute period for questions and answers for media. That's those with the blue lanyards. 15 minutes into that news conference, we'll be joined by a student athlete from UConn. And we'll start our full court press question and answer session. That's for the individuals with the black lanyards. We'll be back in about eight minutes.
Good afternoon. We hope you're enjoying the Yukon Open locker room. That locker room is going to stay open until 145. We have the Yukon breakout sessions with individual student athletes. That's to my right and your left in this part of the room. Five UConn starting players or projected starters are there right now. The rest of the players are in the locker room right now. And in just a few moments, we'll be joined by Dan Hurley, the head coach. He'll do a 15-minute question and answer period with the media. That's from 1.15 to 1.30. After that, the New York Post may not ask any questions because that is an exclusive session for 15 minutes for the full court press individuals, those from that group with the black lanyards can ask questions at that time, and the New York Post cannot. But for the first 15 minutes, general media can ask questions of Coach Hurley. While you're joining us here in the main interview room, this reminder to silence your cell phone. You can't use flash photography or record video or go live from your mobile device. 
That means no handheld cameras, mini cameras, mobile phones, camera phones, etc. during this next news conference. We'll have transcripts from the news conference available almost immediately after it's over. Video is also available to download and video is going out via satellite as well. If anyone needs the satellite coordinates, we have those, as do the fine gentlemen from Hammond Communications in the back of the room. Coach Hurley is up next. This additional note at 3.05 p.m., we'll have a news conference in here with the AP Coach of the Year. That's Kelvin Sampson from Houston. He's coming up right now. 15 minutes in here. You got it. Bobby, any more secret messages for me today? We're joined now by Dan Hurley, the head coach of the Huskies. We see some hands up. Coach, would you like to tell us how your day is going so far? Then we'll take some questions. Yeah, good day. So, uh, you know, for us, just uh, you know, did a lot of our a lot of our live work and the scout work for the uh, for the game tomorrow at uh, at ASU. So I got to see my big brother over there, and uh, I got to spend a little time with him. And now we'll you know, do a lot of shooting and just you know let these guys get a lot of shots in the dome. Sounds good, Coach. Our first question will come in the front row on the left, Zach Braziller of the New York Post. Uh, Zach Braziller of the New York Post. How you doing, Dan? What's up, Zach? Um, as Nate this too, three of the four coaches here were high school coaches, and not really that long ago. How much do you think coaching in high school prepares you for this, yeah. number one? And number two, do you think maybe the fact that you have these high school coaches could maybe help maybe other? Yeah. High school coaches who we all know they're really good high school coaches who just never get that shot. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, th there's an opportunity to, uh, you know, at, at the high school level through trial and error without the college pressure to, you know, kind of work on your craft as a coach. Um, and then you have to do all things in a high school program, so you, know, you, you don't have adobo and three full-time assistants, so, uh, you know, you become a one-man show. So that experience, um, you know, you, you get to develop in every way as a coach. Um, you also, too, you, got a chance, you get a chance to, uh, to witness and get to know a lot of college programs that recruit your players. So you see some programs that did it really well with your players, and then you saw some other ones that didn't do a very good job with your players. So you learn a lot, uh, you know, from that aspect. And then I think with me, Kevin, and Nate, too, we uh, – yeah, I know I, I got to coach low and mid-major, uh, you know, so to have the high school background with the low and the mid-major coaching too, um, you know, it's obviously, uh, you know, prepares you when you get a high major job like the three of us have now. 
Coach up front on the left, Mike. Hey, Dan. Mike Anthony Hurst, Connecticut. Um, What's up, Mike? What's up? You know, even with the, the most important work and the biggest goal right ahead of you, Dan, is there any element of just appreciating a final journey with this group, um, what, what it's meant to you? And, and I don't know if you grow so sentimental at all or appreciate yeah. just being here. Yeah, um, no doubt, a lot of emotion. And uh, just thinking about just, uh, you know, the level of success that, you know, that this, that this group of players and has had this year and you know, really going into the season obviously we we talked about brooklyn to boston to phoenix but you know we were really wanted the big east uh regular season and in the, in the big east tournament championship I and mean, those are the ones you know that we hadn't had we had the the regional championship last year we won the national championship and just the run that this group's been on has been historic uh you know historic within the yukon program and then you know the first first defending national champ to, to get back to the final four so since 2007 so it's been a historic run and you do take little moments to appreciate it but they don't last long coach second row on the left wall street journal hey coach robert o'connell wall street journal you and your players have talked about uh luke's influence on this program especially bringing in like european basketball concepts what leagues has he got you watching these days and what's the strangest league you found yourself watching on luke's laptop at some point <laughs> Um, well, I mean, he's sending, uh, I mean, he sends a lot of clips. Um, i trying to think. I mean, we've, we've watched it all. Uh, you know, Turkey, teams in Turkey, teams in, you know, the, the Japanese league. Uh, you know, we, we, we'll watch. We, we, we watch low division one, division two. We're, we're obviously, we're watching, you know, women's college basketball. We're watching... Um, you know, a lot and you know Luke is Luke and Kamani I mean those two guys are I mean they're, they're head coach quality they're you know high major level head coach quality so they're just they you know those two guys and uh, have no holes in their in their game at all they're highest level recruiters great with player development great with tactics understand the branding piece great motivators coach on the left side by the column Hey, Coach, Jason Fitz, Yahoo Sports. Uh, so, given the fact that you guys are defending national champions and you're winning games in an alarming clip and the way we usually talk about teams doing that, do you feel like Connecticut's being slept on or disrespected in this process? Um, I don't think so. I think a lot of uh, really smart basketball people that, uh, that, that, you know, that watch us play have an appreciation for how well we've played. I think coming into the year, uh, I don't think people on the outside expected us to play this well. I don't know if you stuck a lie detector on me if I thought we'd play this well, um, especially in a tournament that's so hard. It's so hard to advance in this tournament um, and, and, and get to a, a Final Four. I mean, look at you know, the biggest brands and you know, the best programs historically you know, have a hard time you know, getting to a Final Four in, in recent history. So um, I get it, um, but you know, we've been brilliant. We've played great. Uh, the thing about this tournament, though, is uh, none of that matters on Saturday. It's just we're going to have this two-hour game versus Alabama, and uh, if we're not on point, we, we won't play on Monday. Up front and center. Will Dawson with the Christian Broadcasting Network. Last year, after winning the championship, you said something matter-of-fact, but it was very profound, too, in that winning a championship wasn't as fulfilling as you thought it would be. You know that you're a have a foundation of faith. Uh, in light of this weekend, does your faith kind of help keep wins and losses in perspective? Yeah, I think, um, you know, for me, when I get back in the locker room after, uh, you know, a, a great victory, I, I find uh, just a couple minutes to pray, uh, you know, to, 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 to pray to God and, and to be grateful and thankful for giving, giving me and you know the, the team, the strength, and I think about all, all the people that you uh, uh, that you've lost in, in life that are in heaven that have helped you get here. And then uh, when you're going through the struggles too, you, it's the faith, your faith in God, uh, that gets you through the tough times. So whether it's good times or bad times, you know you, your faith in, in in Jesus Christ is is what's going to be your rock. On the right, toward the back, uh, one row behind. Thank you.
Hi, Coach Early. Uh, Kobe Mosley with Student Journalist of the USBWA. Um, my question for you is, uh, how do you know when a player of yours is bought into your coaching style, and how do you kind of see that uh, reflective on the court or in off court? Yeah, I think we can tell in the recruiting process um, b because well, uh, there's our, our visits when we when we talk to them, when we meet them in person, when we have the campus visits. You know, we're not trying to uh, put on a show. It's about substance um, for us. We want them to watch us practice and see how hard we go and. You know, we want to talk basketball with them and and uh, and, and talk about winning and, and and our old school values in terms of our work ethic and accountability and responsibility with a, a modern style of play with basketball. So, you know, we don't try to fool people on a visit by you know showing them the arenas and you know putting together just you know great branding presentations. We make it about ball and. Um, you know, what we're trying to accomplish as, a, uh, as individual players and then obviously as a program. We, uh, we're just old school with the way we go about things. Up front on the left side, Jaden. Dan, Jaden Daly, Daly Dosa Hoops. What's All up, tournament, Dan? you've talked about how much pressure you've put on yourself to get Cam and Steph to this stage. Now, has that pressure ramped up? Has it intensified now that you guys are here? Um, I don't know if it's ramped up. I think... Uh, you know, it, it, it's a pretty consistent, um, you know, you uh, obviously going into uh, going into the tournament, th there was a, a lot of pressure to uh, to get to get to get this team here, especially those guys. You know, you you run through the season the way we did and you just a Big East tournament and all that. And, and yeah, I mean. Wanting to get them here, and now you're you're staring at a chance to make history. You know, you, you're, as a, as a back to back, and and just getting to that championship game and what that would feel like. But you know, I, I don't know. When you play at UConn, we, we don't have the benefit of flying under the radar. We, we don't. So when you get to pressure moments, and everyone that's in the Final Four now feels pressure, we, we don't have more pressure on us than Alabama, Purdue, or NC State because. Everyone here believes that they're going to win a national championship. So what helps us, though, is the pressure that we feel from the beginning of the season because of the history and the tradition and the pressure of every game that we play in at UConn helps us when we get to these big spots because, like, we're not under the radar at ever. So uh, I think that helps us when we get out under the bright lights. Center of the room, Brendan. Hey, Dan. Brendan Quinn from The Athletic. <laughs> What's up? How are you? Um, were there any moments early summer, early off season, whatever, when you had to kind of drop the hammer of that is over, everything is now going forward? And if so, what did those times kind of look like? I would say um, the, the, the closed scrimmage. I thought we had a really good summer. As soon as we saw how good Cam was, um, as soon as we saw how good Spencer was and, and Steph, I think we knew that we, we, we had a starting five that was going to be as good as what anyone had in the sport. And, um, but then we got, we, got, uh, we got drilled in the second half in the close scrimmage at Virginia. And that was a real eye-opener, wake-up call there. Um, we had a pretty good first half, and then the second half we got, we got smashed. And uh, that was, we, we got back, and, and that was a real wake-up call. Um, going into the start of non-conference because that was like right around the corner. Were you, you want to follow up? I was up seething. I was seething. I was, but were you, like, were you a, were, was part of you thrilled to see them get thumped like that and say, no. well, you know, that banner uh, only lasts so long? No, when you see, when, you, know, you know, I guess when you taste that blood that first time, you don't know how the group's going to respond. I mean, you don't ever want to like lose that bad. You don't know that your team is good either at that point. You know, like that was our first real live live game, and you know, just to get beat up like that in the second half of that scrimmage was was jarring. Because when you play bad and lose, you don't no matter how good you are, you don't ever think you're going to win again. But that I rip. I mean, we 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 fourth row right side. <laughs> Hey, Coach, Kurt Kretschmar, Fox Sports Radio, yeah. heard in Hartford on 97.9. Um, how do you think your boys handled the travel problems with the flight getting here after 3 a.m.? Yeah, I think we handled it really well. Um, 
we, we didn't really talk about it. I know that, you know, there's a, a misnomer. I, I think a lot of the external things that you use, um, like the slights, the tweets, the being undervalued, underranked, players not getting their due, what have you, a lot of that stuff is, like, really great during the monotony of a regular season, when like like the dog days of, like, February. Um, but a lot of that stuff, you, you can't use it for as much when you get to this time of year. So, um, you know, like me being mad about the flights <laughs> and, and all these different things, at this point of season, you know, it's just everyone's super motivated. There's nothing but top teams out there. And um, no one cares if you're a little cranky because you missed your sleep cycle. Fourth row on the left side. Hi, Coach. Noah Butler, NAZ Sports. Um, you started the season against a Northern Arizona team, and now you're back here in Phoenix. Is that kind of something you had planned going in, or is that just a coincidence? <laughs> it's just um, lumberjacks. They're the lumberjacks? Yes. Yeah, that's why we, we got the lumberjacks. Tim Russo, too, and Mad Dog. Um, that was part of the deal, I think. They had to take him, and then we would do a bye game. Um, and then Bob out here, and just Nate. I mean, sometimes stuff just happens. Left side by the column. Hey, Ricky O'Donnell from SB Nation. A couple of the guys in the locker room were saying that they often see the old high school history teacher in you come out, referencing historical figures and using it as a teaching lesson. <laughs> uh, how much joy do you take in that and enjoy flexing those muscles? And like. You know, I know your dad also had another job in addition to coaching high school basketball. How do you think that sort of helped you grow as a coach, having, you know, other duties besides for just coaching ball? Yeah, I love that. I mean, I've been a high school teacher. Um, I've, I've, taught, uh, I've taught world history, starting with, uh, you know, the collapse of the Roman Empire, mostly focused on, on, on European history, but from the, the Dark Ages all the way through to, like, the, the Reformation. Uh, so... Um, I've also taught, uh, you know, a driver's ed health, uh, sex ed to co-ed classes at St. Anthony. Um, I mean, being able to, uh, at, at 22 years of age, uh, 22 years old, to be able to teach, you know, uh, you know sex ed at St. Anthony, uh, co-ed classes, you learn how to control a classroom and keep an audience captivated. Um, I think it's definitely helped me as a coach in the huddle. Um, you know, and I think it also helps too to, you know, if you have other jobs, you you um, besides just being a coach, I think it just helps you with perspective a little bit too. Thank you for that. We'll go up front to the right, Bill, and we'll also welcome in Donovan Clay. Bill Road, let's go. <laughs> hey, Dad. Uh, I just uh, have a question. It's, uh, it's been it's been really uh, uh, intriguing to hear you talk about transfers and the portal and all that kind of stuff because you've seen the whole evolution. Uh, and, and I guess I'm wondering, um, bottom line, has it, been, has it been good for the industry? And if you were on the committee to like tweak it, yeah. what would the, the, the tweak be? Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 you know it, it, it's tough because there's just a lot of situations that that come up. You know, I don't know if it's maybe a situation where you you give a player, a, you know, like a like a, a a one-time transfer, and then also if there are circumstances like a coach getting fired or a coach taking another job where there's you know more flexibility involved. Um, you know, I look at my own situation, uh, and obviously. You know, I'll reflect on that. My, my, what changed my life was having to stay at Seton Hall and, uh, you know, work through my own shortcomings and have to fix myself. And, and then also coming to the realization that I wasn't an NBA player um, and that I needed to develop a skill set and a mindset that would maybe put me in a situation where maybe I wouldn't peak until my 40s and 50s and it wouldn't be as a player. It might be as a coach or in business or, or another aspect in life. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of positive things about being able to get a change of scenery and, and uh, you just hope it doesn't create an environment where young people uh, just run from fixing themselves, which is 
usually the issue. Um, so. We're joined by Donovan Klingen from UConn. We'll continue with questions for Coach Hurley and for Donovan. We're going to transition into our question and answer period for those with the black lanyards in the full court press program. But first, maybe we'll take a half court press question on the left side, all the way oh, back. This guy from the beginning of the year. Put your hand up, my man. Yes. Killian Johnson, Sports Illustrated Kids. Coach Hurley, what is the most valuable lesson that the players have taught you this year? Oof, I've had, um, I would say with Tristan, for me, has been the biggest thing, just the evolution of our relationship. Um, I think as a coach, sometimes you want your players, personality-wise, to like mirror you and um, have my same level of intensity, my same level of energy, and, you know, um, and just having an appreciation for having a locker room with, with different types of people, you know, some cool customers like Tristan, some fireballs like Cam, um, some guys that are somewhere in the middle like Kling Kong over here uh, that sometimes are fired up but then also have that confidence level. So, you know, not everyone's got to look like me, sound like me, act like me, or sometimes you implode as a team if you have too many fireballs. We'll take questions for those individuals with the black lanyards from Full Court Press on the right side. Hello. Uh, hey, how you doing, Coach? Um, my What's name up? is Jalen Brothers, Arizona State. Um, so as far as your coaching style, have you picked up anything from your brother or father's coaching style that you put into your own? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, number one, we, we talk constantly, um, you know, a, about about the position, right? All the, you know, the, the tactics, the, the psychology and leadership, uh, the player development piece, you know, how long you're practicing, you know, uh, maybe some uh, some wrinkles and some things that we both like are doing on offense or defense that um, you know that 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 we like. So I, I sometimes you have common opponents. I think uh, there's constant conversations about things that work are working, aren't working, uh, that we're always sharing with each other. Next question is all the way to the right side, all the way up front. Hi, my name's Lainey. I'm with ASU. My question for you is, your men's team right now has a number one seed and your women's team is sitting at a number three seed, which means both have earned the opportunity to compete in the final four. What does it mean to the universities to have such hugely successful programs? And do you think that uh, UConn could possibly take home two titles this year? Um, I mean, yeah, it's it's great to share a building, um, you know, just you know, seeing the work that they put in all year, especially the injuries that they've had and, you know, the struggles they had this season, um, you know, and it's, it's, you know, the basketball capital of the world, you know, to have both schools in the Final Four, it, it's special. Um, you know, we're, we're, both teams are trying to do special things and, you know, we're going to do everything we can to, to bring back two titles. This is like this time of year too, right, to be on the stage for just the university has a, a, obviously an opportunity here to, you know, to capitalize on that. And like Donovan said, I mean, our, we're so just thrilled for the women's team and, and, and good luck to those guys tonight. You know, we'll be, we'll be having our own watch party for that, uh, but they deserve it. I mean, uh, all the injuries and to be where they are is just incredible. Speaks to the talent, the character. We're on the right side still, just to the left of the aisle. Hi, my name is, Ad my, hi, my name is Adriana. I'm uh, with Arizona State. So my question is about superstitions. Have you guys had any of those that you've kind of taken throughout? Yeah. Wrong way, wrong way. This wrong way. way. This way. There you go. I got you. <laughs> um, Walks up. <laughs> have you had any, like, superstitions or traditions that you've carried that through as a player and a coach and even now in, like, in the locker room, any of those? Donovan first, then coach. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, got, like, I, I mean, I have a couple. Um, you know, I – just the way I put like right sock before left sock, right ankle tape before left ankle tape, but like nothing like, nothing too, nothing too crazy. You know, I keep it simple. Um, you know, I, I just don't overthink anything. Just go out to the game and attack it the same way. This guy's crazy, huh? Uh, I mean, I didn't do any as a player. Maybe that's why I, I came up short there. Maybe I should have had these superstitions. Um, what's that? A song like, yeah, I, 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 everyone knows mine. I'm good. <laughs> Continuing with questions for Donovan or Coach, raise your hand. We have two to the left of the aisle. 
Hi, my name is Melody Morris. I'm also with Arizona State University, so forks up. Um, <laughs> Donovan, you have a stacked list of your NIL deals, and they're super awesome. Do you find it hard to balance all of those deals with your schoolwork, or even balancing um, keeping up a certain persona with those deals? Um, no, I mean, you know, I, I, that's why I have people around me helping me. Um, you know, my focus is basketball and school and just making sure all my schoolwork's done, all my basketball stuff's done, um, you know, and if there's opportunities on off days or free time, you know, I try to, you know, get, get some stuff done, you know, with the time I have, but, you know, it's really rest, it's basketball, it's, um, you know, it's schoolwork, and, you know, if you have time and the opportunity to, then I, then I try to do it. Yeah, he loves to fish, too, and I'm just surprised that he, he didn't get anything with any of the fish. You've got nothing no, fishing, right? Nothing. What is a big bat? Fast bow shops. <laughs> we'll go back to that same area and Jalen. So, yeah, basically on that, um, right here. <laughs> yeah, same place. <laughs> now you're good. So, basically on that subject or, like, just with that balance and just figuring out, um, obviously you're in the final four, but, like, and you've been away for, like, two, three weeks now. So for you personally, um, Donovan, have you been able to easily do your schoolwork still and still focus on basketball, or is that kind of difficult right now? Yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know, within the last past couple of weeks, we've done a lot of traveling. So, you know, it's really like on the bus rides, the plane rides, it's just, you know, trying to crank out as much work as I can and, you know, in the mornings before practice. Um, and, you know, it's... You know, right now it's basketball in school. You know, you're not worried about anything else. So, you know, when you're not on the court, you're able to have some, you know, rest time to, you know, do some schoolwork, do some homework, and you know, make sure everything's taken care of. We do have a few more minutes for questions. If there are any from Full Court Press, if not, we can get someone from uh, someone else. Go to the center. Let's get a microphone. The back right microphone. Coach, Scott Sanduli, Cronkite Sports, right here in the middle. Sorry, bud. <laughs> also Arizona State. Let's uh, go. So having a Connecticut kid in Donovan up there with you as one of your top players, what does that mean both for you as the head coach of UConn and for really the whole state of Connecticut that really is so passionate about UConn basketball? Yeah, I mean, I'm just <laughs> – it means a lot more to 7-2. You know, if he was like 6-2, it wouldn't be as great. Um, but, you know, I, I think just in general in your – well, if you're going to recruit a kid from Connecticut, um, it, it's you, it's got to be a home run, you, you know, like because there's going to just be such expectations, uh, especially with the, with this guy coming in. You know, he just was uh, you know larger than life figure, um, you know, coming in. He was like you know legendary kid coming up. There was such anticipation, and then you know to to have him uh, absolutely exceed expectations and. You know, just absolutely knock it out of the park, and you know, be on the cusp of of being you know one of the greatest players to ever put the uniform on as a Bristol kid. That's how you want it to to, to work out uh, exactly the way you hoped it would. Any other full court press questions at this time? All right, we'll take one on the left side. Um, this is this is for you, Dan Mark Ziegler, San Diego Union Tribune. You've been on both sides of this at Rhode Island and then with the Power Conference team. Um, the fabric of the NCAA tournament is Cinderella's. Is, is, with, with the NIL and with the transfer portal, unlimited transfer regulations, are you concerned that that might wipe out the Cinderella because they're just going to keep losing their players every year? I mean, I, well, I, I, it's, it's not going to it's not going to help the Cinderella advance. But what I think it's done is it's created a lot more depth amongst the high majors. If anything, I think it probably hurts the, the, the blue bloods um, because I think that, um, you know, maybe players, you know, pre-NIL, you know, they were moved by the, the brand, the history, the, you know, the attention. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 the power fives and the other high majors now, the NIL has balanced the playing fields against the blue bloods is what I would think is, is probably even more impactful. We'll go up front to Bill, and then we'll close things out with Billy. Hey, Dad. Um, I'm just wondering, um, you know, for those of us who have been covering this stuff for, like, decades, we've seen 
instances of players and coaches whose careers were ruined because of taking extra benefits and things like that. And when you look at some of the numbers, when you look at it, and you look at the old clips, and what they, the numbers were like nothing. If they were playing today, it would be unbelievable, you know. So, so I'm wondering do you, how you feel just as a coach and has been through the system. Should there be some kind of, I don't know if, if the word is reparations or something to go back and, I don't know, expunge the records or saying, listen, we realize we are, th this was probably not a good thing. Or, yeah, how, how do you feel about that? You know what? I, um, I, I, I'm probably not smart enough to you figure out how you would do that. Uh, obviously, there, you know, there are missed opportunities, um, you know, for 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 a lot of players. You know, that way. Um, I'll say this: with um, I personally coach hard. I coached these guys the last two last two years since NIL started. I've coached my teams harder than I've coached any teams, um, just because of everything that these guys now have at their disposal. Um, the resources that the University of Connecticut and you know, programs now invest in these players is not for their attendance. It's not to like just to be on campus. It's to produce and to produce winning. And it's the, the way we travel. Um, you know, the the residents, the the uh, you know the the full service dining that we have in our 40, 40 million plus practice facility. The the NIL opportunities. Um, I, I coach the hell out of these guys because of everything that they get, um, and they have a responsibility to, to work harder and, and, and to represent U UConn and to fight their absolute ass off to win games, you know, for our donors, our fans, the university, because of everything that they get that past players didn't get. I'm gonna wrap things up with Billy on the left. Right, Donovan? Yes, I agree. <laughs> Billy Witz with the New York Times. Dan, I understand that all the coaches at UConn uh, go through uh, CPR training, and I'm just wondering if you can kind of describe what that was like for you and um, how aggressive you were on the dummy. Well, I'm a certified lifeguard. Um, I took, yeah, in, at Seton Hall, uh, a couple of the classes I took that got me to my degree was uh, beginner's aquatics and then advanced aquatics. So I technically... I don't know if that if I still have the certification, uh, but I I'm a certified lifeguard, so um, I have all of those abilities. And obviously, you, you take it seriously because you you know of situations, uh, you know, w with players and with staff members. So um, you know, you we do the training uh, every every two years or so, um, and um, I'm a certified lifeguard. We'd like to thank Donovan, who's not a certified lifeguard, and Coach Hurley, who is, for joining us here in the main interview room. We'll see you guys tomorrow. They're going to go to open practice right now out on the floor. Enjoy. At 3.05, we're going to have our AP Coach of the Year news conference. They'll be right here in the main interview room, and we'll see some of you then. Thanks, everybody. Saying nada.